Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He spent 28 years with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. He was awarded the Governor's Medal of Valor. He's written three books, one of which is called The Hidden War, which we're going to talk about today. He's responsible for co-developing the Marijuana Enforcement Team, or MET, in 2013, which is the first comprehensive wilderness special operations tactical unit and sniper team. He's written numerous articles for a host of different magazines. He's been featured on Fox News, NBC Investigative Reports, CNN, Dan Rather Reports, and three seasons of Wild Justice. He is a tactical surveillance covert and overt special operations instructor and operator throughout the state of California. He taught Grizzly Adams how to be a mountain man (laughs) and is a fucking patriot of the highest order. Please welcome to the stage, (laughs) Lieutenant John Norris. Thanks, Mike, for having me. Great to be here. It's uh, it's great having you. I got to tell you, uh, the the network of of the Brotherhood is responsible for this podcast happening. Uh, I won't say the full name, but uh, we'll just say TH. I uh, appreciate you connecting the dots to, uh, to get John on here. Um, after reading your book and, and learning more of both your story as well as <clears throat> everything you've been involved with with your whole career, I got to tell you, it, uh, it was truly eye-opening for me in a number of capacities. And I think, uh, well, I don't think, I know that our listeners are, are going to share a lot of the same sentiments and probably have their, their tune changed and, and their mind uh, altered a little bit uh, in terms of, of their position on on drugs, weed, legalization versus not, all that stuff we're going to get into real heavy. But I know sure. there were a lot of, of positions of mine that uh, admittedly were, were not uh, informed enough probably to, right. uh, you know, to take the positions I was taking. And, uh, and you know, again, the, the book had a, had a huge impact on, uh, on how I think about things like that. So... I know you're busy, uh, even though being retired, I know you, it hasn't slowed you down any, but uh, I appreciate you making the time to come all the way here and, uh, and share your story with, uh, with us because it is a, a remarkable one, no doubt. You bet. Um, so without further ado, um, I would like to, to start by saying that this podcast is sponsored by Origin. A uh, big shout out to Origin for uh, becoming a, a sponsor of ours and, and a, a partner of ours for this podcast. We look forward to uh, everything down the road that uh, that, that we're going to do uh, collectively. So thank you to Origin for uh, for keeping the, the lights on, so to speak. Um, going right into the lightning round, what is your favorite blend of weed? <laughs> Don't really have one, but I'm familiar with all of them. Because, uh, you know, Mike, that was something when I started my career in 1992 um, as a game warden. You know, I was looking at the traditional stuff. I yeah. wanted to go bust poachers that were spotlighting deer at night. I grew yeah. up hunting, fishing, loving wildlife, hiking all the time. Yeah. You know, that was kind of the spiritual cornerstone. And, and then when this Mexican cartel infiltration of California and all the other states in our, in our great, great nation got on our radar in the early 2000s, and my game warden team of um, patrol guys were yeah. starting to you know, jump in with other law enforcement agencies and do these, these cartel poison marijuana raids. Yeah. Um, I had no idea that was in the, in the game plan, you know, yeah. and didn't know anything about marijuana. I never used it you know, in school. I didn't experiment with it. I just allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> 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 at at, at least as much, uh, as much as I know that I, that I can recollect so far. Yeah. But anyway, it was, uh, it was one of those deals where I got very familiar with, uh, with the, the, the dark side and, and the other sides of uh, legalization on the whole cannabis thing, for sure. Yeah, you know, was, uh, again, I, I knew that, you know, the, the ditch weed and the stuff that's grown, uh, you know, stateside over the last, you know, several decades or whatever, something that, uh, you know, everybody, I, I think, kind of knows or understands that there's new, new and improved hybrids and different stuff. But again, I, I had no, no idea the level with which, uh, you know, the, the technology uh, had advanced in terms of, of what's being done now and things of that nature, it's uh, it's, it's mind-boggling. Um, 
The amount of time you spent in California, uh, I am curious, you know, you, you just left there. What, what is the thing that you hate most culturally about California? I think culturally, I don't even know if it's actually culture, but it's just the lack of awareness when it came to, you know, regulating marijuana after yeah. everything we had seen on the dark side. Um, obviously, we're one of many states that legalized just a couple of years ago under Prop 64. Yeah. Um, we had medicinal laws that went back 20 years. We kind of tightened those up. Um, but a big frustration for me was working, seeing these cartel grows and these EPA toxic poisons that they import from across the border so deadly that you can't even possess them in the country without it being a felony. Yeah. And seeing these growers bringing them across the border, putting them all over the marijuana, you know, that our unsuspecting kids are experimenting with in the Midwest on the black market, medical patients. I mean, this stuff is nasty. And something we were really pushing for at the agency level. And, you know, when I was... When we formed the MET team, 30% of what I did as the team leader and lieutenant was outreach and education. I mean, I had a book on the subject before the team was formalized back in 2010, War in the Woods. Um, we had done three seasons of that Wild Justice reality television show for game wardens. It was the first yeah. of its kind, and it legitimized our profession, showing that we don't just check fishing licenses. And you know, you got yeah. some really consummate tactical professionals within game warden teams. But w the message we were pushing with all of that was, now that we were starting to fight this fight, with a much more aggressive, you know, yeah. environmental criminal, not your typical poacher, when you talk about an armed, you know, cartel guy, yeah. um, and the poisons they were putting in America. Yeah. And when we regulated in California, we were pushing to say, hey, if you're gonna regulate, regulate correctly. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're gonna regulate legal growing and it's gonna happen, regardless of where any of us sit on that spectrum of whether we believe in it or not, yeah. make sure you're not supporting or complicit in a poison product going to people that are gonna use it. Yeah whether it's medical, whether it's recreational. So we wanted to see like the penalties on these cartel guys that we were violently you know, apprehending almost daily yeah. for the last six years of my career. We wanted to see those guys after we catch them prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Yeah. We wanted to see hard felonies for all those crimes. And when everything passed, it was just the opposite. The trespass grow crimes got watered down from felonies to misdemeanors. And then if you were a juvenile grower, and make no mistake, we ran into a lot of younger juveniles that were hardened cartel, you know, youth yeah. coming up to learn the process and getting really good at it in fractions for them. Yeah. I mean, a seatbelt ticket costs more in a violation. And we're, we're sending totally the wrong message, especially yeah. for, the, you know, the sovereignty of America, the protection of our public lands that you and I and our families and, you know, just love to enjoy. And now we've got this infiltration and we've got the, the crimes being watered down. So... That's a cultural thing I did not like to see in California, and where that was motivated, I'll never fully understand. But it was a real, it was a real uh, contradiction to what we were fighting for. Yeah. I, so I mean, two things, I guess, is it's safe to say that the collective state of California, or at least most people, you know, the overwhelming majority, is, is as naive as I am as it relates to what what the environmental impact is on these hidden grow sites specifically funded and, and operated by the cartels. Exactly. But then, you know, to me, the, the second part of that, I, I mean, I, I'm just, just an assumption on my end, uh, but to me that that's, falls directly responsible for either, you know, whether it's the public affairs office or whatever, you know, the uh, department calls it, you know, to me, like that should be, they should dump a, a significant amount of money into some sort of ad campaign Absolutely. You know, to, to let the public know so that there isn't such a disparity between what's actually happening and what people are, are, are thinking that's happening. Because I know, again, for me reading it, I was like, holy shit. Like, I had no idea. I mean, it was the last thing to, to pinpoint one thing that I, that I was most surprised by. It was that. It was, you know, a combination of the diversion of, of water which again makes sense, just not something I thought about. Right. But then, m even more so was the was the nasty chemicals. But uh, we, I've got a number of questions that, uh, that we'll go a little deeper into into a lot of those things. But uh, just in in moving down the lightning round to uh, kind of <laughs> knock the rust off, what's your favorite Olympic sport? Oh man, that, that's a good question. I'm kind of a biathlon guy. You know, I've been a shooter yeah. forever, so I like anything involving shooting and athletics. Yeah. I really, really enjoy that. But I like everything about the Olympic sports. Yeah. yeah, I follow them every year. I like the winter Olympic sports, especially. Yeah. You know, being a skier, I learned to ski really late in life and yeah. 
you know, I was around a, a family member, you know, a lot of family that were, you know, on skis at four yeah. and I was learning at 30. So yeah. the learning curve for me was really slow and I was thrown <laughs> into double diamond stuff with, uh, with yeah. some really good skiers in the family. And, uh, yeah. it was one of the most challenging sports for me and I just loved it. So, yeah. but both the winter and summer sports across the board for sure. Yeah, no, biathlon is a, is a pretty cool sport. I always like watching. I mean, I, I love the Olympics as well, both summer and winter. But uh, I, I think it's neat to, a neat question to see where, where people's uh, interests lie as it relates to Olympic competition. Um, the other thing on that, speaking of that, um, I really enjoy the swimming sports on the Olympic front yeah. because – one of the I've always liked the water and being a team guy, you know, I'm sure you can relate to that. All, oh, the, yeah. all the work you guys should do I the hate water. the water at this point? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, ironically, growing up, I was an adequate swimmer, but not a good one. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started getting into triathlons and did a couple Ironman triathlons as kind of life goals um, in my 30s and in my 40s. And that was my weakest sport was yeah. doing that big, long, open water swim in current yeah. with everybody swimming around. So yeah. I watched those race, you know, just those those race monsters go, yeah. the Phelps of the world. You feel like you're out there doing laundry. Super inspiring. Yeah. yeah. Yep. <laughs> Seeing it. Um, if you so this is, you know, whether it's apocalypse or, or not, you have one gun to have the rest of your life. What is it? Oh, man. Um, if we're talking pistols, it's going to be my Glock. It's going to be probably a 19X that I'm pushing now. Yeah. And we were, uh, we're a Glock family in Fish and Wildlife, actually yeah. in California in 1992 when I started. Um, I was given all the spec out sheets to get speed loaders and holsters ready for my academy cadet class to run a 686 wheel gun, yeah. you know, 357 Smith. Yeah. And I thought, that's all right. You know, my dad's a big python shooter. You know, he was a 1911 competitor in, in Ipsic and stuff. So I, I was familiar with both. But then when I got to the academy, my TAC officer, a Vietnam veteran, yeah. um, army guy, uh, was pushing a Glock 22, one of the 40 cals. Yeah. And it was brand new. It was kind of like, you know, the combat Tupperware. Other agencies didn't want to go to it, but they had the, the fortitude to really study and get past the rumors and select that when all these other agencies were, you know, selecting these big steel yeah. decocking systems. Yeah. And I just grew up on the Glock, man, from my early days as a law enforcement officer and loved it and was an armor in that platform for 30 years. And then, uh, as much as I like the 40, you know, it gets down to ammunition availability yeah. and the new nine millimeter loads doing what they're doing. So yeah. that, that would be my standby. Yeah. So you go with the 19X. Yeah, yeah. I, re I really like that new 19X. You tried the 43X? I have. Yeah, I have a 43 actually yeah. as, a, as a concealed carry and yeah. I love that gun and the 43X is sweet too. Yeah, to me the 43X is, is like, uh, it's the gun I've been waiting my whole fucking life for, yeah. honestly. You know, Size the, is right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. because the, the 43, to me, even though my hands aren't uh, aren't baseball mitts, it's still a little too small and, and even at, at a 9 caliber, it's a little hard harder to shoot. Right. The, the 19 is great, but sucks to conceal, let's be honest. Yeah. You know? and, yeah. and so to me, that 43X, that that happy medium to to still be able to rock 11 rounds and they make a uh, the the tlr the streamlight makes a tlr6 it's called i've got it on my 43 yeah i mean it, like, that thing's awesome yeah. you know and to have all of that in one package that uh, is still very shootable 11 rounds to carry and and really easy to conceal like i just uh it's like where you've been all my life yeah i, I love that damn it's a good system yeah. i agree yep. yeah um Worst, well, we'll get into the long guns, uh, actually, in, in some of the, when we start talking about some of the sniper stuff, but uh, sure. worst vacation story or shittiest spot you've ever been to? <laughs> oh, man. Um, All right, so for the audience that's, uh, that's not watching on YouTube, he just, his wife is here. Who is that? Uh, and, and, and he looked over at her as soon as I asked him where the shittiest spot or worst vacation story is, so... Man, I'd have to think about that one. Um, I don't know if it was, is there a good story. Maybe she wants to jump yeah, in. Yeah, it was. I don't know if it's quite a quite a vacation story, but um, I used to run the Baker to Vegas relay race, and we were out in Vegas for a vacation, and we'd run from Baker, California, all the way down over the Pahrump Pass, and then uh, get down into Vegas for the finish line, a, a, a kind of a twenty officer, you know, multi hundred mile relay. Yeah. And uh, I had one of these hill climbs. And I had had some really, really bad Mexican food the night before <laughs> in Baker, California, and it probably wasn't oh, the Christ. best place to, to have food. And um, getting through that run, brother, was nothing but a mental toughness of yard by yard. Did you, did you it, swamp ass during the run? I, I did. <laughs> I, I did a little bit of that. I, I swamped a little of that. I uh, you know, blew a bunch of gas throughout it. I took some sidebars you know, to, to yeah. kind of rehydrate. <laughs> but when I made it over the lip, I had one mile of a steady downhill, and it was just like kind of the wind at my back to get through yeah. that. And uh, God, the next awesome. couple of days of recovery time, yeah. but um, we made it, but it wasn't a pleasant experience. Yeah, that's awesome. 
Um, all right, so here's a political question, and then we'll get into uh, the actual book. Uh, and this is just off the cuff for me, is uh, what physical competition do you think that should be included in the non-incumbent presidential race? So in this, in, in this cycle, it would be the field of the 20-plus Democratic candidates. If you were to throw in a physical competition that's part of that race, what would it be? Oh, man, I'd want to see endurance running. Yeah? Yeah. So I, I, was gonna, see. I was going to go with, like, boxing. That true. Yeah, you know, we could, we go hard contact. I'd love to see them kick the shit out of each other for a I, little while. I'd, I'd like to see, yeah, I'd like to see that battle for sure. And I'd, I'd like to see uh, how much, uh, you know, mental endurance and physical endurance they have or don't have for, for yeah. that matter, yeah. you know, in, in the long distance push and see how well they hold up. So who, who would you put uh, your money on in a long, long distance race? Oh, that's a good question. It's probably going to be uh, the young guy, Pete uh, Buttigieg, I guess, probably because he's 37 as a former Army guy. But I don't, I don't think Bernie's going to last a whole lot. <laughs> I don't you know. think between those two, yeah. yeah. Bernie and Biden probably... would be a uh, fucking wheelchair in it. Yeah, Pete's probably got it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what is your morning routine? Um, that's the question I like to ask everybody, uh, excluding travel, you know, your normal day-to-day you wake up in the morning, what time do you get up? Do you eat? Do you work out? Uh, walk us through that process. Yeah, if I'm not on the road, like you said, um, it's up by about mm, 6, 6.30, give or take, depending yeah. on what kind of night we had the night before. Um, very, very light breakfast. Don't eat a lot. Just, just uh, you know, kind of get get enough nutrition in me to do a workout. And that workout's going to be one of two things. It's going to be a, a good long endurance run in the forest of Montana with some calisthenic stations along the way. Um, do very you make blood. those up as you go? Or? I, I, I yeah. do. We, we, we have a lot. We have some, you know, core exercise guys that we had on MET. Yeah. And we actually had a, you know, a 20-year SEAL team veteran. Yeah, Frog. I, Frog, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, when we're not on the air, I'll mention his name because yeah. he wanted me to give a shout-out to you as oh, a fellow awesome. team guy. I talked to him yesterday. But... Uh, when we improved all of our tactical training for the specialized team, we wanted to get the physical training in, in yeah. it as well as trauma medicine. And, you know, um, Frog being a, a seasoned veteran of physical training in the teams and also teaching that, yeah. you know, he's a PT instructor. So we got a lot of core exercises. A lot of us had, had to get re-familiar with in addition to runs and just grinding out log carries, team things. Yeah. But when I'm by myself, it's, it's that type of thing. And if I'm, if I'm in California where I can be near a really big pool, a long distance pool, an Olympic size pool. Yeah. I'll get in the water and just push out some distance. Um, I love to swim. Yeah, you know, it's just as I get older, and now that I'm 50 plus, you know, yeah. the aches and pains of recovering from heavy yeah. runs and that trauma. Yeah. Um, swimming's just a little more forgiving on the body and just more comprehensive. So yeah. it's a good mix. So do you, uh, in terms of diet, I guess you know, you said you you eat a little bit to, you know, to fuel the workout. I mean, are you doing anything in between, or it's or it's, you get up? have a little bit to eat and go right to work out. Is that the first thing you do? And then also in terms of diet, like do you subscribe to keto or paleo or any, any type of specific eating style, or is it just uh, kind of whatever you feel like eating? Or how does it, it, It's a healthy kind of protein, you know, at a balanced based diet, but not a keto or, or anything in particular. Yeah. Um, and then it depends if I'm training for an event, um, like when I was doing Ironman triathlons, that was a whole different game. You know, yeah. that was five to seven small meals, the the protein, you know, carbs and lack thereof, yeah. and and electrolyte balance and all of that was something more critical. Yeah. And certainly, I'm on the road right now doing more outreach and not training to that level. And hopefully, yeah. I will again for another event down the road if I can ever breathe again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're right. not pushing good messages, but uh, yeah. but yeah, that's how I do it. Yeah. Well, rock and roll. It's good stuff. Um, getting into your childhood. Um, you know, that you talk a, a fair bit about it in the book, but for the listener, if you can kind of synopsize where you grew up and, uh, you know, family life, sports, siblings, uh, you talked, you know, at length about, uh, you know, kind of what led up to, to join in, um, you know, the department that you did. But uh, if you can kind of talk, talk us through what it was like growing up where you did. Yeah, it was a uh, group in the Silicon Valley of California, kind of the tech capital um, before it blew up in the 80s. Yeah. So I was uh, grew up in a small town called San Martin. It's kind of an equestrian farm, country town, south of the uh, Silicon Valley hub, about 20 miles. So, um, you know, grade school and, and uh, junior high there, high school right there locally. And, you know, for us, it was it was one of those things where we grew up without a lot of resources. You know, um, my mom was kind of raising us on her own at that point. Um, and she was working two jobs and four kids yeah. all a year apart. I'm the oldest of four. She called us her wolf pack, yeah. you know, so I was kind of the alpha of the pack. And, you know, I was, uh, I was doing things like part-time jobs, you know, right in junior high to kind of help make ends meet with everybody. And um, really at that point, you know, there were a little bit of struggles with all of that. But the target there was, 
just to do something that was one going to support the family, you know, be successful, be one of the first to go to college, and being in the outdoors. Yeah. I mean, one thing ab- about it was when when my dad, you know, um, was with us, you know, for the first. 12, 13 years of my life. And then we had a, a time apart. Mm. We had to for about 12 years. And then uh, fortunately came back together and, and developed a really good relationship. Um, was that uh, some sort of falling out? or Yeah, it was a divorce with the two oh, of them. You. And, um, you know, he and his family were in Montana with, uh, you know, my grandfather, career Navy, dad being an Army guy and stuff yeah. like that. So, but there was a window there that he was there and we were, you know, in the Bay Area doing our thing. Huh. Um, and it, we had to be, you know, just had to be a part. It was just a tough window of time. Uh, how old were you when that happened? I was 12. 12. And yeah. to me, that, that's, uh, you know, I'm curious to get your take in terms of, you know, you look at, at kind of the societal norms today and, and the stressors that are put on kids, for, you know, the kinder, gentler, you know, patting and coddling and, and things of that that seem to be more prevalent. At the time, I'm sure it seemed very hard on you to to be bridled with that type of responsibility of, of being, you know, the oldest child and and having to to work to help make your uh, ends meet and help your mom out and, and things of that nature. But you you hear and, and a lot of the guests that I have 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 stories of things that happened when they were kids that uh, not necessarily were traumatizing, but were were hard. Right. You know, and and because of that, uh, taught them a lot of things that honestly have have been a driving force in getting them to where they are today. Uh, a, do you do you think that that played a big contributing factor? I don't know how it couldn't. Uh, but B, um, what's your take in, in terms of, of kids today and not having a lot of that and, and how that that reflects on our society? Do you see it as a problem? Yeah. No. To your point, Mike, on on question one. Yeah, it definitely definitely had an effect. I think. Um, I didn't have the typical childhood like some of, uh, you know, my, my colleagues in high school did where they had mom and dad together, you know, they were very successful Silicon Valley jobs, so they're fairly affluent. So they had some freedoms and I think a little less stress Mm -hmm. and not a judgment one way or the other. But for me, it was like, you know, I don't really have time to play around right now. Yeah. I, I cannot afford not to get good grades. I cannot afford not to excel at, you know, what, what I'm going after, um, and I was always one of those guys in school that I never was the top, but I was very close. Yeah. You know, I was always the top three in PT. I was all the top three in academics. You know, I just really tried to do a good job at, at what I believed in. And my mom had a saying um, early on, you know, she said, guys, we're not going to have a lot, but we're going to have each other. Yeah. And we're, we're going to work together. And just remember, if you're not passionate about something, don't do it. Anything worth doing is truly worth doing with 100% of your ability yeah. or don't waste your time. So... Um, under, under kind of that, you know, that model, it was jobs to help out and my kind of mental break from the stresses of that, of what was going to be next and putting that pressure on myself was getting in the woods, you know, running, hunting, hiking. Um, I had passed my hunter education, you know, with my dad's help when I was like nine years old, Mm -hmm. he was an avid hunter. He was a competitive shooter, an incredible shot, um, you know, up on the championship trap and skeet runs throughout the whole state of California. And fortunately I had those building blocks before there was that separation with, with he and I for about, about a decade or more. And that kind of kept me going. You know, and it later led indirectly to, it's kind of an interesting story how it all kind of came together, but I had never met a game warden any of those years hunting with my dad, which when I got to the academy in 92 and I tell my colleagues that, they're like, well, what rock did you live under, dude? (laughs) What the fuck are you doing? And why'd you even be, how'd you know about this job? And what was funny is I was going to be a civil engineering major following my uncle's footsteps, my mom's youngest brother, because I knew it was a successful career. You know, you can make a good, decent living at it. Um, I would never have problems supporting my family, whether it be my mom, my siblings, or my future family. Um, and I like to design. I was drawing and drafting. I like to create the mechanical aspect. So I got into that program at San Jose State. It was an impacted program. I got into it. I got some scholarships and financial aid, all that. So I was a set to go. And I'm doing, the, I'm doing the classwork my first semester, getting the grades, and I'm completely flat. I'm just not feeling it yeah. at all. You know, I'm around all these other engineering students and we're having study groups and the pocket protectors and pocket protect. Yeah. I'm just like this, man, this isn't me, man. Yeah. This is not me. I gotta be, I gotta be doing something that's given back some other way more physically. Yeah. Well, then it's just fucking boring. Right? And, and it was that yeah. absolutely brother. You hit it. So I end up, um, on a, uh, a winter backpacking trip with uh, my future brother-in-law. Yeah. Jeff Moore. He's now my Baja racing team partner and, and one of my best friends, you know, since childhood. And, uh, Jeff and I are hiking into Henry Coast State Park, 
second biggest state park in California. We're dead of winter, right before Christmas. There's nobody in this park. We got a pack horse named Lucky with saddlebags. It's a pouring rain day, Friday afternoon. I've just finished my finals, and now we're going to find this this lake that we've never been to in the dark. It's Hike like some night. shit out of a country song. A pack yeah, horse is. named Lucky. Pack with saddlebags. horse named Lucky, and then it almost sounds like a team mission. You're going to yeah. go out on a 13 mile hump at night, yeah. you know. Except we didn't have nods and we didn't have GPS. Yeah. So we uh, we find this freaking lake after a downpour, and we're hypothermic. We're frozen. We're you know just rained on. So we, we build this illegal fire. You know, we knew we shouldn't have a fire in the park, and I was supposed to, whatever, but we did. We had to dry our stuff out. And the next morning, here comes the green 4x4 truck, compound low range, winding down the hillside, coming up to us. And I thought, is that, is that one of the rangers checking us out? And it was a game warden. Yeah. And what he thought, what he was patrolling for, and I had no clue at the time, is he was looking for black tailed deer, trophy black tailed poachers in the deep rut when deer season's long over in a state park. Yeah. That park happens to have amazing deer in it. So he finds out we're just some dumb college kids, you know, having this backpacking um, failure. And he's gonna let us go. And I go, wait a minute, you're not a park ranger. So I kept him there for two hours and bent his ear. Yeah. And as he's telling me, oh yeah, you know, I've, I'm a law enforcement guy for wildlife. I work mostly alone out of the truck. There's no backup. This is what I do. And I was blown away. My eyes got about as big as silver dollars. Jeff saw me the whole rest of the trip after he, we, he kicked loose, finally pulled himself away from us. Um, the whole rest of the trip, I was just talking to my, my brother out loud about this over and over again. And as soon as I got back to town, when we made it back in, I went to the criminal justice program advisor at San Jose State, met him in the middle of the winter break, told him my dilemma. He said, we got you. We're one of the best schools in the country for this. FBI, DEA, federal ATF, you know, local PD, game wardens at the state level. This is the degree you need. And yeah. that next semester, man, I was on a criminal justice program yeah. targeting this. That's awesome. Did, yeah. uh, on that hi hiking trip or camping trip, were you guys carrying anything uh, weapon-wise? We Fire were. Wise? Yeah. What, like what? Uh, and, and I guess when you were growing up, you know, again, like thinking of teenage kids running around the woods with fucking guns now like they'd be arrested and their kids right. their parents would be fucking arrested and whatever I, I am curious what did you typically carry at that age and and on that trip was there a, a specific frame Did yeah. you talk about the 243 when you were growing up yeah that was my that was my primary deer rifle that's what i learned on learned yeah. to hand load rounds for and stuff like that on that particular trip i think it was just a handgun you know for yeah. protection and just mm -hmm. uh you know a no crap emergency and at the time it was probably my first auto first and only auto pistol that i had was the old ruger p99 that oh, uh, really? that old nine millimeter decocker that was yeah. before um you know it was it was before i was a, a game warden the glock was just barely coming out the Glock 17 didn't really have access to that didn't know anything about that platform but yeah, yeah that old Ruger was the first auto I had yeah. and that was my standby for a lot of years till yeah. I uh, got in the Academy yeah um, before you talk about kind of your your Academy experience and, and what have you obviously growing up the way that you did and, and that story was is what catapulted you into it was there anything when you were younger uh, any sports that you played or, or any influences that that, that uh, you know, guided you along that path also, or, or was that pretty much the extent of, of you know, what, uh, what led you to, to the line of work that you did? Yeah, you know, in, in, in school it was a lot of football, you yeah. know, we just, and we had our own football games. I mean, my sister is a retired San Jose fire captain and she was, you know, the one, you know, girl with three brothers. But dad got us into NFL football like early on. She became yeah. a diehard Steelers fan. Your sister did. Yeah, she <laughs> did. Awesome. So, and then, and then when, when, as we were in high school and college, and then later even professionally, um, she would get referees from the fire department, set up line judges. We'd do, you know, a Thanksgiving game, a Christmas game. We'd do, you know, full blown 11 on 11, and it was tackle. Yeah. It wasn't flags, but we didn't have protective equipment. So, yeah. you know, some firefighters were blowing knees out. Some of us were, you know, getting <laughs> chipped teeth, and yeah. it got stupid, but that was, that was the fun stuff we did there. And then it was all wood stuff. It yeah. was hunting and hiking, and, you know, just kind of learning ways of the woods and getting into, and we, and we, lived and grew up in that you're familiar i'm sure with uh, some of your time in southern california on the teams and the training areas yeah i remember in your book you mentioned the manzanita <clears throat> yeah. traps that was our country yeah so i was hunting through that stuff and you know hiking through that stuff and crawling yeah. through that stuff yeah and that was uh that was kind of a, a growth experience as well yeah when uh during that time of you know the 10 to 20 we'll say uh spending a lot of time in the woods did you do any Boy Scouts or, or any courses or read any, like there's that uh, SAS survival manual or uh, even the Boy Scout manual for that. Like, were there any resources that you used 
to learn field craft, survival, shit like that, or, or was it all just figuring it out as you went? Um, I did read manuals. Yeah, I, I, I read a lot of those. Um, there was a, a Green Beret survival manual yeah. that I had got a hold of, I remember, in high school. And that's something when I was in that engineering program, you know, I was always on the fence of wanting to do something of service, you know, whether it be the military or law enforcement, but I was in that civil engineering mode for really for economic survival. But in the engineering program, I had the opportunity to go into ROTC and a special forces program yeah. with the Army. And that's the direction I was looking until I found that game board and changed my major. And when I was talking to those guys, they had recommended a book. And I don't remember the title of it now. I'm sure I have it in the archives somewhere. But it was a it was an SF survival manual, improvised shelters, traps, you know, everything, yeah. you know. Did you, uh, did you find, because here's one thing that I, I know, I, my same kind of thing, like I grew up always always uh, desiring and, and finding myself wandering off in the woods and read a lot of the survival books and some of that stuff was didn't work where the shit right you know I'm, I'm curious yeah. did you have a similar experience there's a lot of things I'm like this doesn't fucking work this is you know it, cheesy as shit but then some of it yeah. was, was worth the shit so yeah it, it was it was a mixed bag you know <clears throat> what would work and what wouldn't work and then yeah you know everything from honestly it was my dad that taught me a bunch of stuff and I have a couple of uh, uncles, some younger uncles on my dad's side, that really taught me the ins and outs of mountain survival, and, and that all came from Montana, snow country, you know, white-tailed deer hunting, chasing elk, um, things like that. And, uh, I mean, harsh condition stuff, yeah. you know, not, you know, what we have, that Mediterranean comfortable. I mean, we have some cold days in California, but... You know, I was running around in oak woodlands and the coastal mountains at 3,000 feet. And then, yeah. you know, I get up to the northwestern corner of Montana now. That's a whole different ballgame. A whole different ballgame mm -hmm. when it's 10 below, you know, and you're in four feet of snow and you're up in those big storm fronts coming out of Alaska yeah. in the middle of hunting season when survival skills really matter yeah. and, the, and the techniques are really critical, you know. No, that, that's no doubt. And the uh, one of the things that, uh, that I think, you know, you, you just can't replicate or manufacture is that that type of tutelage from somebody that knows how to do it uh you know there's no book or or video or youtube series or whatever that you can watch i mean going out and doing it failing fucking things up and right and you know figuring out your way through things especially if you've got somebody to, to kind of help uh you know pick you up off your feet as you're fucking things up but uh you know there's there's no substitute for that um, I, I love that kind of stuff. I mean, I take my kids camping every summer, and uh, you know they're both girls, but I teach them everything I can uh, while we're out. You know, some some things they're interested in, some things they're like, yeah, fucking whatever. But uh, you know, drinking by the fire hose and just uh, overexposing them to, to that year after year, I think uh, you know some of it's got to stick. But um, so you you have the the long conversation with uh, with the game warden. Go back, decide to change your major. Can you walk us through uh, that process of of joining? Because I know there's going to be some listeners out there that uh, that may want to follow in a, in your footsteps in that regard. Sure. But I'm, I'm curious as to what that process is, how competitive it is, et cetera. You know, when when I got hired back in '92, it was it was really competitive um, from the standpoint that a lot of people wanted the job because I came from the generation where we were raised to be in the outdoors. We had a hunting and fishing and conservation background. We love wildlife. We understood that hunting, you know, enhanced and protected wildlife in the big picture. And so to do that as a career, even though it didn't pay the best, that's what it was all about. Mm -hmm. um, and to get back, I had, we had, you know, gone ahead, but you asked me a two-part question a while ago on kids now. And this isn't a judgment or a dig on kids now, but look at the difference. Yeah. I mean, coming from like, let's say the Silicon Valley is a template example. I look at kids now, even, you know, kids in my own family, nieces, nephews, and, you know, uh, the children of, of other friends, and they just don't have that outdoor exposure. Yeah. Either because of the digital age, because of games, because of, you know, social media, or they're living in the city. Yeah. And, you know, they don't get it to this. They're not moved by that. They've never had that exposure. Yeah. And they might be if they just had the exposure. Yeah. So what we started to see, unlike when I was hired, we had this long gap in the last uh, 10, 15 years where it was really hard to get candidates as good cadets that would be good game wardens that would be really comfortable around people with weapons. Yeah. Because I mean, a game warden, 95% of everyone you check's got a gun and a knife. Fortunately, yeah. about 92 or 3% of them yeah. are good Americans that you want to, you know, that you're just like, yeah. they're your eyes and ears. But to get that comfort level around guns, if you don't already have it, you know, mm -hmm. um, to be really comfortable in cold or super hot conditions when you're having to be out for long hours on stakeout to take down a poacher. Yeah. If you haven't been in the outdoors as a kid, 
man, it's just a turnoff. So, I mean, uh, is it now where you're getting uh, candidates in that are just fucking clueless as it relates to the outdoors? We we actually we had a lot of that. To yeah. be honest, we had a lot That's of crazy. a lot of that about ten years ago. And something I did right up until I retired is I taught at the academy at least two or three classes a, a, a season. And for me, it was always a tactical stuff. I taught a what we call a um, tactical surveillance class. Myself and he's codenamed Marcos in the book. One of my longest friends on the team, back to patrol days. We would teach these guys just how to hide and camouflage themselves, how yeah. to sit in a hillside in the brush on a hot day yeah. and do overwatch and surveillance and get in a ghillie suit. Yeah. And you see these kids, you know, from the city, these millennial no kids. No idea. They have no idea, <laughs> but then they start doing it and they're like, this, this is, is awesome. amazing. Yeah. I'm really doing something, you know, yeah. and, and kind of the light bulb goes off. But when I was hired, that wasn't the case. Yeah. We had a lot of hardcore veterans, you know, we had yeah. a lot of hardcore police, uh, PD guys. We had young guys like me growing up that just wanted to be in the woods. So when I was hired, we were getting like 10,000 applicants a year for like 20 positions. Yeah, Jesus. And we were getting military veterans coming back. And since I wasn't technically a veteran and hadn't served, um, you know, they were at the top of the list with some veteran preference points, rightfully so. And the most I could, I could rank even if I maxed the test, which I did, was 95%, a veteran can come in with 110% or 105%. So veterans and laterals from other agencies had preference, but I was very fortunate to be one of four civilians that scored high enough through the testing protocol in all phases to get into that fourth academy in 1992. Wow. So I was surrounded by seasoned military veterans, law enforcement guys from other agencies. I'm like 21 years old, yeah. wet behind the ears, <laughs> and I'm with some real, real good dudes, man, yeah. like in their 30s and 40s that have yeah. seen it all, you know, overseas special forces guys in yeah. the military. And that was, that was, that's what I was going up against then. So getting it was the holy grail. Yeah. Fortunately, fast forward to right now, we're getting great candidates now yeah. because something that was kind of a mixed bag with me is, you know, how much do you want to send the message? How much do you really reveal in what you're doing, even in a special forces realm or special mm -hmm. operations? But with the books and the TV show and stuff like Wild Justice, when my chief decided to uh, jump on the bandwagon and try the first Game Warden reality show on Nat Geo, you know, there were four or five of us that they kind of hovered with all three seasons because we brought really good cases, had a lot of energy, passionate about what we do. Our canine handler we're going to talk about later, Brian was one of those guys, I yeah. was one of those guys, a few others throughout the state. Um, but that showed the world the diversity and the challenges of what game wardens really do, especially in yeah. a progressive state like Cali. So yeah. we were getting veterans now coming back from the sandbox. You know, this is 2009, 2010, war on terror that you and your teammates have been fighting on the SEALs and, and every other group. They're like, and I didn't realize it, but so many SEAL team veterans, as an example, are hardcore outdoorsmen. Yeah. They grew up hunting and fishing and just love to protect that yeah. part of America. So we were getting guys like that coming on board. Yeah. And I'm training them in the academy. And I'm going, oh, man, I've got a, you know, third special forces sniper. I've yeah. got a SEAL team, you know, yeah. uh, an Air Force Siri instructor as a cadet. And so now we're getting tier one guys doing the job. But yeah. we, we, we had to. We had to blow up some outreach yeah. to even show what we did. So. Yeah, I think it's kind of a necessary evil. I know there, you know, there's a lot of uh, mixed emotions. I think when it comes to guys like me and and from my line of work that write books and right. do interviews and shit like that. You know, it's um, in in many ways frowned upon within the community, but uh, but in some ways it's also embraced. And I think, you know, again, just you know whether it's my realm or, or yours, I think yeah. it's, it's similar and that, you know, it, it's just a necessary evil to be able to inform the public enough about uh, certain elements to where you attract the nation's best to, to fill those, those spots, you know, and I, I know I was influenced by reading a lot of the Vietnam team guy books. Right. Uh, and articles written and shit like that, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you wrote it. Like I said, I I, I love the book, uh, read it straight through, and and uh, really really enjoyed it. Um, and it made me think of, and we'll talk about you know kind of what the fix is uh, toward the end of it. But it, it made me think of a lot of ways to that you know some ideas that I had that uh, you know of potentially helping kind of employ guys like me and and fill some of the roles which uh, which we'll get into but uh, i appreciate remind. that brother and, yeah. and, I, and i'm glad you liked it yeah. you know and it was the same thing and you doing so much good outreach you know with this this format and this medium it's a fine line but we always felt and uh you know our, our last couple of chiefs have always felt that outreach is the key for a small little agency doing big things yeah. that don't have that reach and so i i think i agree with you you, yeah. you have to tell the story 
to attract the right people, yeah. and just to educate America on what's going yeah. on right under their noses, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, the, the PR aspect is uh, it's, it's necessary. Uh, I am curious, so the Academy, uh, how long is it? For us, it's just over seven and a half months. And is that at uh, the Fletzy Center down in uh, Georgia, or do you it's, guys have your it's own? It's not. We have our own in California, because we're technically a, a state agency. Oh, okay. yeah. We are federally deputized through yeah. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, but since we're a state agency, uh, under the resources, you know, director, under yeah. the governor. And right now it's uh, up at Butte College, um, yeah. right near the town of Oroville. When I went through, it was Napa Valley College. And our academy is an interesting program where it's a full police academy that every, you know, post peace officer standard and training mandate for any California law enforcement officer, doesn't matter who you are. Oh, so you're going through with like chips and... Well, we're doing well, our own. It's yeah. actually our own academy, but we're doing their exact curriculum. Okay. So we have to get all the basics and that's usually five and a half, six months. Yeah. And then we go into eight or nine weeks of just the wildlife stuff. Okay. So we do like that tactical surveillance class I mentioned. Yeah. That's not a standard police academy training where you learn what I, it's basically about a day out of a sniper school I would teach with my colleagues, yeah. with other agencies when we're doing sniper training. Um, things like that, and then wildlife ID, wildlife forensics, you know, how to, how to you know, take a dead animal that's been poached and treat it like a dead body you know, and know how to go through it and analyze it and, and solve a crime based on everything from DNA. We do the same thing with wildlife crimes yeah. as we would with, you know, a human murder. Yeah. Um, and all those different wildlife specific things that game wardens do that traditional law enforcement don't have to. So yeah. it's it's a long stretch. I mean, to me, it's it's surprising to hear that, that it's that heavy on just the law enforcement side, which I mean, I, I think it, it needs to be, especially in today's day and age. With, right cell phone cameras and, and uh, everybody's got their fucking juris doctorate walking around, you know, <laughs> I know my fucking rights you know, oh, yeah, while, right, while right. their camera's out. But, <laughs> you know, so I, I, I understand why it, it's so heavy on that. But I am curious, to me, eight or nine weeks seems a little short given how much you guys have to be good at and what you right. have to know on the on the wildlife side. Is there like a an extensive OJT kind of thing where you go out in the field and, and you get mentored? Is that why it's so short? Or? Yeah, that's actually the key right there, Mike, is we go through all of that, then we have a field training officer program, what's called an FTO program. And that's where the cadet just graduates the academy, then they immerse with a, a veteran that's a trainer yeah. for one month, and they do that three times with three different trainers oh, all nice. over the state. Oh, that's cool. And they're evaluated in like 26 critical task areas. It might be 27 or 28 yeah. now since I've left. But um, they're evaluated in all those areas <clears throat> daily. Um, and it's it's a great program. It's yeah. a stressful program, but they, it's, it's so one-on-one. -on -one yeah. And uh, Do they fuck with you at all? Like, do they um, play any jokes? And like, the, there's there's some of that going know, on. Can you, can you give us an example? Like, the you know, go get the fucking metric crescent wrench or you know, <laughs> shit like that? <laughs> oh, yeah. There's all that kind of stuff going yeah. on. There's also the kind of thing where, and, and again, it's just kind of like... Um, you know, when, we're, when we talk about, say, canine training, or I talk about, you know, new team guy training for special ops on MET, you know, it's like take them right to the limit and see what their stress level is, yeah. how they multitask, how they decide, how they prioritize, yeah. and then back it down um, just to make that cadet better, to make yeah. us better. And I had a lot of that. I, I had three amazing FTOs. They were legendary. Yeah. You know, there were guys that I was just like freaking out about. And these are the mentors, you know, that, yeah. that you have on the teams. And, and uh, I got three really good ones and they really didn't mess with me that much. But what I do tell cadets now, and I was an FTO for over a decade. Yeah. I trained eight cadets. I was an FTO lieutenant after that program. <clears throat> I love that training and being part of that training curriculum. But um, one thing I always tell cadets is, like when I went through it, I think I was I was going at about 80% of my potential because I was so hyper concerned of how was I doing this? What does it look like? Am I missing something? Rather than just getting out there and flowing, you know, because yeah. you're so in awe of these guys. Yeah. And I just tell cadets now, I'm like, look, they're they're there to help you. Yeah. You know, they are all that in a bag of chips. They're the legends, but they're the legends for being good at what they do, not for just being a tough ass. Yeah. So try to flow. Yeah. You know, and um, but it's hard. You know, when you're driven, you know what I'm saying. I'm, I'm preaching to the choir oh, yeah. on that. Yeah, I mean the SEAL teams are notorious for hazing and getting fucked with and whatever. I, oh yeah. I think they do a lot less of it now, and I I think it it's reflected in. In some of the culture in the teams, that's a, a podcast in and of itself. But, uh, <laughs> right. You know, th there's an element of that I think that is not only good, but it's it's fucking necessary ultimately. And that uh, you know, you, you police your own, and and uh, you know, there are certain aspects of being hard on each other that uh, that save lives and, and keep shit tight. But um, it, it was neat to read about. You know, you you very quickly gloss over the you know of your 28 year career, the first half of it, the first 14 years. 
your service seemed to cover kind of all spectrums of, of the department right. there within, which, uh, you know, I, I think is good and necessary in terms of, you know, any, any good boss, supervisor, manager, whatever, or even a coach for that matter, knowing kind of all aspects of the job. Could you, uh, you know, in, in terms of being able to lead and train and whatever, you have to know, you know, what, what everybody's do, done and been through and, and what they're going to be doing, et cetera. Sure. Could you kind of synopsize for us that first 14 years? Obviously, the bulk of, of what we're going to talk about is the book, but before we, just before we get into that, uh, just kind of walk us through that, that first half of your career and, and what all that entailed so that people understand, you know, where all of your experience came from in terms of the second half. No, you bet. It was, you know, like we said in the beginning of the show, it was it was pretty traditional stuff, um, but it was diverse. And even though I'm from the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, I kind of wanted to work at home. Most game wardens do. We yeah. want to work at home. We don't want to have to do the big move for the family. And um, but it was so impacted when I was hired in '92. The only vacancies were in Southern California, so I got uh, I got sent down to a place called Lake Elsinore. Uh, when my captain in the academy said um, that. I thought he said Lake Almanor, which is a pristine mountain lake in Northern <laughs> California. And everyone, you know, kind of all my colleagues in the, in the, in the academy kind of, kind of perked up. And they're like, uh, did, you, did you understand me, Cadet Norris? Uh, that's like Elsinore, not yeah. Almanor. So yeah. I'm going down to Riverside County. I'm going down to the Inland Empire. I'm right over the hill yeah. from L.A. I know where that's at. And it was, yeah, not far from, you yeah. know, well, San Diego a sky, County. There's a skydive uh, area in Lake Elsinore yep. that, uh, that we go to a lot. But. Yep, that's I was working right and watching, watching those shoots fall. So um, I went down there there for my first three years. That place was crazy. That place was gangbangers from LA coming over the hill, going into my little rural canyons with AK-47 spotlighting for rabbits and deer. Really? And gill netting at the back end of, of lakes and dams that fed these creeks. And I would be out there, and my whole thing after the Academy stories and listening to those legends, you know, and the big cases they would make is, I'm going to get the hardcore guys killing wildlife illegally at night, spotlighting them, yeah. thinking they're, you know, immune. So I was taking on some spotlighters, um, knowing that they were gang members, doing vehicle stops by myself, because we didn't have backup, we didn't yeah. have partners. Um, and I was getting gangsters, Norteños and Sordeños and all this crazy stuff, you know, from, from the LA basin with felony weapons and converted machine guns. And I was getting some crazy cases. Oh, shit. And it was freaky. And that was like the first, second year on. Yeah. Um, and so that was a learning curve that I wasn't probably supposed to dive into so quickly, but it happened by just by design. And then I started making relationships with other agencies right away. I mean, Riverside County Sheriff's Office would f hear about me. I'd finally meet these guys. And they're all, who is this young game warden running around the canyon by himself? Is he crazy? <laughs> so they'd have their patrol helicopter up at night. And they'd hear me go out on a call, and I'd call for backup. I'm, you know, I'm blacked out, you know, chasing these guys as they're banging away with their lights. And I hear AK fire. I'm not taking them alone. No way. Yeah. I've learned the hard way on the first couple stops. And they're bringing in their helicopter with their spotlight, with their FLIR. They had all that stuff. We didn't. And they're just lighting that guy up is I'm doing a vehicle stop and, and these guys are coming in their sedans trying to get to the back country, <laughs> breaking axles and stuff, you know, to, to make the stops. But um, that's, what's, that's how it started getting into that. Yeah. And um, after three years of being down there, I got to go back to my home area. Yeah. And that was a blessing because my home area had all that same stuff, but to a lesser extent. Um, it didn't quite have the level of criminality, the gang issues like L.A. did in the Silicon Valley. It was much different. So what I learned in Riverside County in three years of doing that and developing into a firearms instructor early on and developing, you know, outdoor education programs for women and kids that hadn't been involved in that, um, I was kind of tasked with developing a program called Becoming an Outdoors Woman that's now a nationwide program that takes women and young ladies that have traditionally not been exposed to those hunting and shooting sports that the men in the family have and, and get them exposed. Oh, that's cool. And it was really cool. And I was yeah. doing that, you know, like two, three years on. So yeah. the, the teaching role was starting early. Then I went home. And then I spent, you know, the better part of the rest of my career there. But it was getting on the coast and doing marine patrol, getting on our big patrol boats. And, and I wasn't really a big ocean guy. You know, I didn't grow up on the ocean yeah. per se. Um, but before you get into the water stuff, I'm still reeling a little bit from the gang, oh. <laughs> gang banger Elmer Fudd cro like cultural crossover. Like, right, that's a good way. You know, they, they were uh, I like that. Like, there's gang bangers with AKs rabbit hunting. 
Yeah, you believe it. It's yeah. fucking crazy. Rabbit, like, coyotes, all and deer. the shit that I would have never thought was. Yeah, happening. brother, we have a saying: if it crawls, it falls; <laughs> if it flies, it dies. That's Holy how these. Shit. That's how these SoCal poachers were. God, that's yeah, they just wanted to kill anything that moved. Yeah, yeah it was crazy. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so yeah, so you go up the coast and uh, and you get some water work in. Yeah, we're doing doing some water work with some uh, academy classmates, you know, that are now on big patrol boats, and I'm learning that whole thing: commercial fishing violations, guys poaching fish. You know how just operate on the ocean. You know offshore, that was that was a, a real neat development in the career to get to know that. And then I started specializing in illegal baiting operations. And this is something that really kind of brought in what would later lead to some special operations stuff as far as stealth and stalking, all those kind of tactics. What we do in sniper craft, both military and law enforcement. These guys that would in California is a no baiting state. You know, we would we have so much impact on our deer resources all over the state, but in, in, especially like our black-tailed deer in what we call the A zone of the Central Coast area where I was from, and we would have these you know private landowners way you know as many as 20 miles into the backcountry, putting illegal baiting operations together and just sucking in not only the bucks from the property and all these deer, but they'd be bringing in changing the whole diversity of how the herd's supposed to go. They'd be bringing in big bucks from miles away, off of parks, off of other properties, and basically just shooting them over bait. Very unsporting, but it was also changing the diversity of where these deer were supposed to be. So there was a biological component too, but they were never getting caught. Yeah. Because to, <clears throat> to catch them, you'd have to get so far into the backcountry and have to have, be so tight on your, your field craft, how you set up your hides, where you observe them from, how you do takedowns, it's what later was like running a special ops mission on a MET mission. Yeah. But we were doing it from a patrol standpoint with hardly any help. Which, so it would be me and a partner, you know, maybe sitting on a, a, a location. My first baiting case in 96 when I came back home was a guy that had been doing it, this old uh, affluent rancher that had a pepper farm uh, agricultural operation in the Silicon Valley. And he would run all these cold peppers, bell peppers, like truckloads of them, flatbeds, and take them way into the back country, dump them all over his property. It was going on for like 20 years. Yeah. And he had been worked by my agency two, two times previously with previous wardens and the sheriff's department and never been caught. So when I heard about this guy, I consider that the ultimate challenge. I'm like, yeah. that's total bullshit. He's doing this. And if I can just not have to do the traditional stuff and just be real visible, checking licenses all deer season, I want to dig in camo style, just go deep, get the right partners. And if we have to sit on this guy all six weeks of deer season, we're going to sit on him until we watch him try to take an animal over this bait. Yeah. Because that one poacher was worth <clears throat> catching more than a thousand fishing license tickets because he was the guy making the impact on the wildlife. And he was intentional. Yeah. So you, you mentioned the, the field craft and, and kind of going, you know, balls deep, so to speak. Is, right. Was, was there really any of that in the academy or, or in the OJT? Is, do they focus on field craft type stuff at all? They do, but at the time it wasn't nearly as advanced as it is now so they spend more time now yeah they yeah. spend much more time largely because of the class we brought and, yeah. and that class was developed and i was asked by the academy coordinators to develop that class because of what we were doing in the baiting arena and that those skills actually came from me and marcos going on our own time and dime because very crazy out of the box kind of freaky for game wardens to be going to swat operator schools yeah. or carbine or go to a sniper school yeah. but me and mark did that yeah. We did that because we knew at some point in the future, the direction of California with wildlife poachers, it was a crossover to you know, anything from domestic terrorism, homeland security. You get a lot of weird people in the woods doing a lot of weird things. Yeah. And it's not just wildlife crime or it's you know, wildlife crime is secondary to something else they're planning. Mm -hmm. And game wardens were starting to run across this. They were starting to run across you know, Al-Qaeda groups training. No exaggeration. Some of that was happening in Southern California, not far uh, in, in parts of way eastern in, yeah. uh, San Diego County yeah. when I was starting out. So we knew that a team like what MET developed into was going to be needed at some point. We knew the agency wasn't ready for it at the time. Mm -hmm. um, probably other agencies weren't ready for it at the time because yeah. they weren't taking game wardens that seriously. Yeah. So we went to our own sniper schools. We built guns. We you know, got in with some good Bay Area SWAT teams that saw what we could do and were backing us up on some of these crazy wildlife capers. And they weren't really paying attention to who we worked for. We yeah. were now brothers. And thank God to them, yeah. you know, for letting us in. Because well, at first they were kind of looking at you like, who the fuck are these game yeah, wardens? Like, yeah, right? Yeah, like, yeah, what are these good bird and bunny cops, you know? <laughs> I mean, you know, what, yeah. what, what, what? These, yeah. these fishing license guys? And, you yeah. know, what, what are they doing in, in a SWAT operator school on a team, you yeah. know? And, 
Um, but but it did. It, it really. Um, we did all that training on our own. You know, it wasn't supported by the agency. They they didn't have a budget for it. Yeah. So we paid for it ourselves. Built rifles. Um, best stuff we ever got early on. That was that was pre nine eleven. Yeah. And then you know, I mean, again, I think I'm preaching to the choir, brother, when I say after nine eleven everything changed. Not only on your front, military, but domestic yeah. law enforcement. Oh, yeah. Everybody was looking at who could provide something for a force multiplier. Mm -hmm. You know what we call uh, you know mutual aid. Um, allied agency relations and when that stuff started to happen you started to see and not not every game warden was into it they wanted to do the traditional stuff and there's nothing wrong with that but some of us saw a bigger picture and we knew that you know we can't quite got into the marijuana cartel thing yet but when we did and saw that as a domestic threat um, and then some of the other things we could help other agencies with we knew those skills were really valuable and and, yeah. and that's and the baiting stuff started that because you had to use all of that field craft yeah. to catch these guys did you end up catching the guy that we uh, did you did did you have we to caught sit on him the whole six weeks or? we set on the whole six weeks yeah. we would go in and and this is how you know kind of stubborn i was and my old partner he's now retired joe but he was an academy classmate and then Marcos, when he joined my squad later, we ended up doing 10 more big cases in, in the span of about five years. But in that first case, um, it was every weekend, parking and hiding on a ranch, taking an ATV ride, doubled up, up to another ranch, backpacks, going a couple of miles, set up cameras, <clears throat> your weapons, and a surveillance hide about four or 500 yards off a particular bait pile, and then have all that ready to be broken down in a minute if you had a scout coming out looking for you, how to cover tracks. Um, we had counter surveillance going on by these guys mm -hmm. where they would get to the gate and put up binoculars and look right at where our hide was, oh, shit. 300 yards away. So I'm face painted in full camis behind you know, a brush barrier I've created layered back to hide all our surveillance equipment. And I'm with my binoculars looking at him with his binoculars going, oh shit. Jesus. Talk about the eeriest feeling ever, feeling yeah. like you were just, just violated and you've yeah. been made, right? <laughs> yeah. And I'm just looking at this guy, Mike, and going, and you know, and, and I was okay, but I wasn't the most patient at that time in my career, but Joe was 15 years older than me and had been a diehard hunter much longer than me, and he goes, just don't move. Yeah. Trust movement, trust your camo, even though he's got optics, don't move. And sure enough, he watched me for about three or four minutes, he scanned the area, he put the binos down, he unlocked the gate, he took the load of bait in, no shit. business as usual. And yeah. I'm like, okay. Yeah. Big learning day. Yeah. That was a teachable moment. And, yeah. you know, Fucking asshole pucker factor was Oh, it sure, was, yeah. dude. It was crazy. But yeah. uh, we ended up catching that guy on the last Sunday of the last weekend after seven weeks when he brought a whole crew in. He baited all season, looked around, but never actually hunted till that last week. And we got him on that Sunday night. And it was, it was a major celebration with the, yeah. the surrounding landowners and the friends we made yeah. in the community to work that case. So for something like that, what uh, at that time, like what? What did he get slapped with penalty and, and sentencing wise or whatever? Like what, what was his punishment for that? Yeah, it was misdemeanor, so it wasn't real heavy, but they lost their weapons forever and they had nice weapons, nice yeah. optics, nice stuff like that. Um, they had a hunting ban for several years where they couldn't hunt. Um, they paid big fines and restitution of several thousand dollars. So, yeah. and, and they got some convictions against them. So yeah. on, on a guy from the Valley that was basically a farmer, but you know, kind of a corrupt one on that, on the wildlife crime side, it was a pretty good hit yeah. for the time considering, yeah. yeah. Uh, in, in that first 14 years, you know, between the first three down at Lake Elsinore and then moving up the coast and the water stuff, were there ever any instances where you know shit got into it with people, whether it's a gunfight or uh, just, you know, gnarly stuff where your, your life is essentially on the line? There were a lot of that with um, with the spotlighting stuff, yeah. and it was a lot with the gangsters. Um, I never got in a gunfight down there, fortunately, but there were a lot of close calls. Yeah. There were a couple times where, uh, you know, it, it could have happened, but because they gave up at the last second, or they decided, you know, um, or I had tactical advantage, or I had a partner with me, or backup arrived, that we that we uh, we were able to not have a gunfight. Yeah. But there were real close calls. One, I remember one of those spotlighting cases not far from Lake Elsinore. It was a head-on stop with three guys and they had everything from bolt action, you know, heavy caliber hunting rifles to lever actions, a couple of AKs and SKSs. They had a bunch of tequila, they, you know, pretty drunk. They had tequila beer, I mean, even lines. That's were, racist. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right? It, it, I'm painting a picture, yeah. not going there. Yeah. But anyway, I stopped these guys and um, one of them had a, a $50,000 no bail warrant and was wanted in Mexico. Oh shit. And I didn't know it at the time, <clears throat> But that was that was a cartel guy that was a grower. 
Yeah. And that was starting down there way back then when those DTOs, those drug trafficking organization groups, were just starting to come across the San Diego County line and start, you know, their clandestine grows in Riverside and San Diego County. And these guys were from a grow, it turned out, but they were out recreating, out of the grow for the weekend. And I caught them on a spite lotting stop, got them, brought back up. We took them all to jail. I mean, this was felony heavy stuff. So yeah. it was a big night. They yeah. decided not to fight, but that was an oh, yeah. you know, oh shit moment, big yeah. time. Um, yeah, that's but, crazy. But we didn't know a lot about what we know now. Yeah. So. Yeah. Now, it, you know, again, a lot of fascinating stories, which we'll get into the book now in, in terms of the the second uh, 14 years of your career, uh, predominantly starting in uh, August of 05. Yeah. Um, if you could kind of talk about the, the transition, if you will, and, and where this book stems from as it relates to that second half of your career and, and how the, the MET team and... Uh, and how, how the, the focus and shift uh, toward illegal grows and, and, the, and battling it out with the cartels where, where all these awesome stories come from. How did that come about um, in terms of leadership and where you guys were at? How, how did that all form? Yeah, it was, you know, I think it was a matter of everything aligning in the right time and the right place. It certainly was seeing this and discovering it. And I actually saw my first grow in Santa Clara County or in the Silicon Valley um, on the home front, and I was a uh, wasn't I was a warden still. It was just a couple months from promoting a lieutenant, and um, I remember I got a call, and my first book goes into this story because it really started the whole 90 degree shift of where we would not go traditional. You know, we were both to quote, you know, bully go where no one's gone before on the wildlife front. We were getting pretty radical yeah. after what we discovered, <clears throat> and the thing was, is I got a call from a good friend. I'll remain, you know, nameless. Um, that we grew up with hiking, hunting, big outdoor guy. And he's doing his master's study at San Jose State as fisheries. He's a biologist, a fisheries bi wildlife biologist. And he, uh, this was very close to that co park where I met that game warden. Mm -hmm. And it was on a property that um, was the headwaters of this place called Coyote Creek. And Coyote Creek, just in a nutshell, is one of our last remaining steelhead trout migrating tributaries all the way from the South Bay of the Ocean. And those fish are threatened and endangered all over the country. I mean, they're like $40,000 a fish right now. They're Jeez. almost extinct. So he's studying fish. He's studying, you know, endangered frogs, watching these waterways for like a three year study. And I get this call. Um, early morning one day, like in late April. And he goes, John, this is crazy, man. I'm up here in, you know, Dexter Canyon. You know, I got two creeks I'm studying. We got all this winter runoff. There's no reason they should be dry. One's bone dry, one's running fine. He goes, the one that's dry, fish are dead. <laughs> you know, everything's gone. Frogs are, you know, drying up and uh, it shouldn't be dry. Someone's diverting the water up top and I'm seeing a lot of like plastic and bisqueen and little debris that's washed down. Can you check it out? I said, yeah, 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 we'll check it out. And you got to jump in the car with me. Let's go up top and we'll dive into the canyon. We'll find out what the heck's going on. Well, we didn't have any real knowledge that any of this was going on, you know, from the cartel front and it had anything to do with cannabis production. So I'm thinking some farmers diverting water up top. We're going to have to go track it down and we're going to have to, you know, deal with it. So I grabbed my assault rifle, my backpack, you know, he's an unarmed civilian. He's got, you know, his survival stuff. Savvy in the woods, fortunately. We parked at the top of this big mountain, we dive straight down this steep canyon to find the water source, no cell coverage, radio doesn't work, we're on our own. And sure enough, we find where the creek's been dammed up, there's a water diversion pipe in it, and Mike, that we just followed that pipe down, you know, mm -hmm. tactically, carefully, and quietly, and about 200 yards later, we start to see ahead of us about 50, 60 yards, two foot marijuana plants, and then we see what looks like a, you know, almost like a hooch, you know, like jungle type Vietnam, but hidden camouflaged, a lean to, looked like there was a cook set up in it, but everything was spray painted camouflage. And I'm like, this isn't a rancher. Yeah. This is trippy. These guys are hardcore. Something's going on. And then we saw the two growers and they were working through their plants coming up from further down the creek. But, you know, AK-47 in one hand, big machetes, saw a pistol in the, in the other guy's waistband. Um, Mexican guys, definitely Hispanic in nature. Didn't look like they belonged there, definitely. Yeah. Did not fit, looked like more like a Sandinista camp, something going on, you know, completely, yeah. completely out of the ordinary. And they worked that canyon and we hid in the cut bank and I had my red dot, you know, um, with my AR pinned on these guys thinking, this is gonna get really bad really quick. 
and this is going to be a weird one to explain. Yeah. If we get into a freaking gunfight down here and I have a civilian with me, and this is a marijuana situation that doesn't have anything to do with a traditional violation, yeah. well, they got about 15 yards, and then they, they hooked the bank. We stayed hidden. They didn't see us, and they went about their way and doubled back, and we made it out of there undetected. And that was the change of everything. Yeah. That was sometime in, that was April of 2004. Well, we brought a tactical team in of narcotics guys. We turned it into the narcotics group because game wardens didn't do drug work. Yeah. That's not their job. Yeah. But nobody knew the terrain, so they wanted us in there to be the bird dogs, to be the guides, to get them to the trail. So about three weeks later, I had a, another game warden partner with me. And um, we had four or five different agencies. We had the military counter drug team, the Air Force Pavehawk pilots from Moffett Field to support us that day. Had never worked with the military domestically, you know, on anything yet. And we went in, we guided these guys in. We got down to about 50 yards from the bad guys having their breakfast early in the morning. And the team leader decided to make an announcement really far away. What did these guys do? They got up, they had their escape trail figured out, they just started running down the canyon. And we had had this conversation, well, if these guys are close and we can get to them safely and run them down, let's catch them. And you know, there was a sentiment at the time in this mission, we're not gonna run anybody down, there's too much risk in it. We just, if we get them out of there safely and they don't have weapons, we're just gonna eradicate the plants and get out of there. So nobody chased. And then finally I talked to the team leader that was running the mission. I said, can we just track them and see what direction they went? He said, that's on you guys. So myself and my game ward partner, we ran down after them and they had too much of a head start to catch, but we tried. And a couple sheriff's deputies from the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office and his code name Snake in the first book, and he is referenced in Hidden more if you remember uh, certain parts. Yeah. He was there as a guest to this operation, not running it either. And that's when you know you meet those right guys at the right time, you know what I mean, on the teams, yeah. and you're just bonded forever. Um, he saw the way I worked, I saw the way he worked, and he was the only guy that wanted to run in. He said, the fuck are we doing not trying to catch these guys? Yeah. And it was after we finished that mission, I realized these are DTO cartel operatives from Mexico here illegally, deportable felons. And we didn't try to put the grab on them. Yeah. And they're just thinking this, this group of cops are just, uh, you know, they're never gonna catch anybody. And we didn't know at the time that these guys will just immerse in another grow. They're just a commodity in the organization. So then we eradicated 7,000 plants. Didn't know they had banned poisons on them. Didn't know anything about that yet. So we were touching this stuff without gloves or face protection, much to you know our our uh, negative re results. And then um, we took all the plants out, brought a pave hawk in. That was cool. I did my first hoist ride into a pave hawk. That was e ticket. Yeah. Hadn't worked under choppers quite yet before we yeah. got immersed. And um, I was looking around, going, "What are we going to do with all this stuff, guys?" I mean, the creek's dust. Yeah. The water's diverted. That water diversion's still there. We haven't restored the creek. We haven't taken out any of this trash. All these poisons and fertilizer bags that are on the edge of this creek are going to go forever. They're just going to keep destroying wildlife and our waterways. And um, they're like, well, we don't do that. That's, that's up to the property, the park that this is on. They're going to have to handle that. And I'm looking at this pave hawk hovering above us with a net capacity of four to 5,000 pounds. They can pull a ton of stuff out almost. And I'm like, we have free military resources. Not only can we try to catch bad guys better, but besides just getting rid of these dumbass plants, why don't we do something for the environment maybe to deter these guys from coming back? They don't want anything to do with it. And I understand that was, that was the mindset. Yeah. But that changed the exposure. And then 05 happened. And um, getting into 05, yeah. Real quick, uh, before you do that on the on the cleanup thing, it makes me think. Uh, I mean, isn't shouldn't the EPA have fucking teams that like you can just call them and say, hey, this place is all fucked up. Come come clean it up. Isn't that half of what they're supposed to do? Brother, I wish that was the case. Yeah, but it, it's not. It really comes down to individual jurisdiction of who owns the property, and if it's private land. Unless we have funds where we can operate on private land, the private landowner is responsible for it. And that gets into a whole other issue that we learned a lot in the Met days that Hidden War covers. Um, but no, there was no, no capability of that. So it was really on us trying to convince the other agencies to s stay a little longer that day with all the resources and just help out on that phase. And it would take another 10 years to get there before yeah. we were effectively doing that. Because one of the stats that I read that I found surprising was the 44%, you know, was, yeah. was about, about, you know, just under half of these grow operations right. that you're busting that you're actually able to clean up. And it's like, well, holy fuck. You know, again, to me, it, the EPA has fucking billions of dollars. Right. It, it, to me, it, it, this is just me, but 
it should be like EOD, right? Like right. If we come up to a uh, fucking yeah. bomb, you call EOD and they handle it. I mean, to me, you guys come up to an environmental fucking catastrophe, you should call the EPA and they should handle it. Help us out, yeah, for and, sure. But, you know, so, I mean, again, I, I know there's a lot of politics, but... Uh, Write your fucking congressman, if you're listening. Um, <laughs> well, again, right, if we expose the issue enough yeah. with things like the book and, you know, the TV we've done on it, maybe we'll get enough Americans pissed off yeah. to say, hey, this reclamation of these growth sites, it's necessary. It needs to be yeah. a, an inner border priority, and I agree. We need yeah. to do something more with it because we're not getting it all. Yeah, no, absolutely. The uh, Yeah, the, to me, it, it seems like a fucking no-brainer. But um, All right, so then moving into uh, the next operation where uh, where it kind of all kicked off and shit went downhill, if you could walk us through that one. Yeah, so we're talking August 5th, 2005, um, as we're going into that, and there's a date that, you know, is kind of burned in forever. Mm -hmm. That was a career changer. Um, the real blessing of that day, out of all the bad things that did happen on August 5th, was the people I got to work with. Um, I mentioned Snake, who I met on that one raid, that he was a guest and I was a guest, but we instantly had that bond. We're going we're gonna to do this a little more aggressive. Well, he was one of those guys that was a top sniper on his SWAT team. You know, he was a Pennsylvania woodsman and hunter his whole life. I mean, he just tireless, mentally tough, could go forever, martial arts instructor, humble, you know, yeah. um, just the right personality you would want to do the hard jobs. And he saw that same thing in me and we clicked and became instant friends. So he started bringing me in as an equal from a game warden side, you know, much to, you know, the question of some of his, his supervisors are like, what are, what are you doing with Norris and these game wardens, man? And, and, you know, he would, he would throw us kudos like, Hey, I've been on grow raids with them. And these guys are so good in the woods because of what they do. He goes, I will take John and anybody he vets for from his agency yeah. more so than a hundred of my different deputies. That was a big that was a big statement yeah so he called us in on this raid in 2005 he said look man um it's big we don't have a lot of personnel everybody was short nobody knew the magnitude of the dangers no one had been shot we hardly ever found bad guys um you know no one had been in gunfights and no cops had certainly been shot you know there'd been some civilians shot at before but not in that part of the state so snake called me up and said hey we got this big one on sierra azul it's right above los gatos you know kind of an affluent little suburb of the silicon valley i mean and Mike, this site was surreal because we're an eye shot of like Google, eBay, Facebook. We're an eye shot of the Silicon Valley tech capital from where this gunfight went down. Yeah. Um, I had two young game wardens with me. I had my partner in Santa Clara County Warden, Mojo, as he's codenamed. Um, and he had wanted to do marijuana work ever since he got out of the academy and heard what we were doing. And he was really motivated, kicked ass in the academy, was a great partner. Um, been my squad mate for about a year, and I had promoted to be his boss about 14 days before the gunfight. So I'm his supervisor and friend and partner. He's coming on his first raid fired up. We got another um, uh, young warden that came out of that same academy and um, codenamed Bulldog from San Mateo County, and he's all fired up. And, you know, they're painting up, they're getting tactical, getting their stuff ready to go. And we're three wardens, three sheriff's deputies. And at the time, there were a lot of things we didn't have that we should have had. We didn't have radio compatibility. You know, they were on a separate system. Um, I mean, we had handy talkies without earpieces. That's how, you know, archaic the technology was at the time. So we're going up a, a team of six to get to this growth site. Um, we've got a, uh, an open space park ranger that was unarmed, but very savvy in the woods, being our bird dog and our guide. So seven of us. And we get up to the first grow site and, you know, we crawl through a brush tunnel. We surveil it. We do all the surveillance we can. I, I carry pocket binoculars to pick apart little things ahead of me before I, you know, breach a trail. And uh, we didn't see any threats. So we crawled through this first grow. It was, you know, plants were about three, four feet high. They weren't mature yet, weren't ready to harvest. And then they went to another brush wall, a heavy manzanita. It was manzanita country. You know, you're familiar with that. Oh, yeah. And then we get into a second tunnel. And we crawl under that tunnel, and same thing. We assess and visually, you know, kind of surveil everything, wait about 10 minutes. You know, you couldn't hear a bird chirp. No animals were moving around. It was one of those areas that are just too quiet. And the oh shit pucker factor immediately, for those of us that are familiar with how you should feel in the woods, we all felt like something was off, but we just couldn't see the threat. Hmm. And we waited, and we went through that tunnel very carefully, covering each other. And then we formed a skirmish line once we went through the Manzanita Tunnel into a much bigger grow. And this grows like probably 50 yards by 50 yards square. We're on a top of a pressure ridge that kind of rolls off edges. 
And the plants are tall, they're five, six feet, they're all budded, they're ready to be cut, so it was harvest time. And you know, between the manzanita and all the marijuana plants, you could see you know, about two, three inch little visible windows as you're going through this maze of vegetation, mostly marijuana. And as we, as we were assaulting and doing a skirmish line to clear the grow, we heard one shot. And that shot I knew, another pucker factor, because very familiar with 762 fire from an AK or a 3030. We shoot a 308. We were shooting the M14 M1A at the time as a battle rifle. Our sheriff's deputies were shooting a 556 standard M4. And those are two distinct booms. Mm -hmm. A big 3762 versus a 556 crack. This was that middle AK sound. And when I heard that round go off, I knew right away that came from a bad guy that I didn't see and no one had called it out on the radio, and I know somebody else hadn't seen it. And in a nanosecond after I heard the concussion, all I heard was, Mojo, I'm shot, fucker shot me, and he's just yelling, but he was pissed. You know, he wasn't, wasn't screaming out like a victim, he was just like pissed, I've been hit, fuck man. He drops, and he drops to my left, just out of sight, and now all I have is marijuana to my left, and I start to, I'm looking around and scanning for a threat. I don't see this threat. And then all of a sudden I start to see, um, I start to hear Craig's AR-15 or snakes banging away and I can't see him and I can't see you know, his threat, but I can see gases like pushing the marijuana in my peripheral vision. That's how close we were. We were only about three, four yards from each other, but out of visibility. And so I start to you know, um, scan over to the right with my weapon and as I'm starting to turn I see some movement out of my left side a little bit just peripheral and I look over to the left and here's a grower and not like any grower I'd seen quite dressed up the same but in green BDUs kind of battle gear had what I thought was an SKS a fixed stock AK type and he's got it at port arms and he's coming like around the brush pile unbeknownst to any of us at the time, but that was the guy that had shot my partner, and now he was coming around to scan and finish the job or assess what he had done. So I just make an announcement, and as soon as I got out, I say policia, because he was, he was Latin, Mexican, I start to say policia, and I got through about POL, and all of a sudden that weapon turned on me, and I just started engaging with my M14 and backpedaling, and I ended up at Kyle's feet. So uh, real quick, ROE-wise, rule of engagement-wise, I mean, at that point, you know somebody has, has shot. Are you guys bound legally to not engage until they shoot at you specifically? Or, they or don't could you ha have dropped him just for holding a gun and one of your partners being shot? They don't have to shoot at us, but that gun has to be a threat to me or my partners under our rules of engagement. So even though he had a gun and it wasn't pointed at any of us, it was one of those fine lines. And because I hadn't done this work that much, yeah. and I was thinking about... I certainly didn't want to analyze our rules of engagement to the point of getting hurt or getting my partners hurt, but that's something that is constantly in our minds on law enforcement on the domestic oh, side. And, and Mike, that's what's so fucked up about it. Yeah, no, you I, don't, know, I don't envy your guys' position. You know what I'm saying? And, and I mean, this was, this was above Silicon Valley. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing armed gunmen running around, yeah. but the guns pointed away. So I basically let out that announcement knowing pretty much intuitive that he wasn't going to give up. Yeah. I'm pretty familiar with, I'm getting the hang of what these cartel guys are like. So as soon as he made that turn and didn't give up and that gun started to break the plane toward me and my partner, because yeah. I wasn't, at the time we didn't really know he was the shooter. I mean, I was certainly suspecting that in, in rapid time, mm -hmm. but we didn't know how many threats we had out there. And what I did also realize, the gunfire from Snake's weapon was engaging that gunman's partner that was behind a parapet seven yards in front of me where they had dug out a, a, almost like a parapet and had some trash and debris behind it, behind the wall of brush where their marijuana field ended. So it was a tactical overwatch position on the up end of the grow. And he had a sawed off shotgun with 12 gauge, a 12 gauge sawed off shotgun with buckshot, pistol grip, chopped, trained on me and, and bulldog, but we couldn't see him. So I'm starting to go to engage and see what's going on over here. And Craig is neutralizing this guy that's about to pull the trigger on me with a shotgun, and I wouldn't be here today if Craig had not identified him and engaged him. And all this was <clears> happening <throat> without radio communication. So the domino effect of who was reacting the right way, we were just super lucky we had the right people on the hill. Yeah. Because even though we hadn't trained a lot together at that point, they worked under the same tactical firearms and tactical movement training we did. We just didn't know it yet. Yeah. 
which was good that we had done that tactical training that I mentioned Marcos and I had jumped into because we were training our guys that way on the game warden front. We had reinvented the, the tactical rifle qualification course. We got away from a static line accuracy course to a movement course from 100 to three, three yards yeah. that I had put together. Um, move and shoot, don't stand still. I mean, it was a muscle memory thing. If I hadn't backpedaled when I engaged, I would have taken fire from this guy. He was 15 yards away. Yeah. And Craig got low, and he engaged with his AR, and he got several several vital rounds into that bad guy that had the shotgun on me. So Did he drop him? He did drop yeah. him. He and Apache, who's another sniper, a veteran Beirut um, Marine Corps uh, sniper on the team, had actually come up around the backside to support the gunfight when he, when he heard the first gunshot that, that hit my partner. And then when he heard Craig's you know, 5.56 five, start going off, he knew we were into stuff. And then he heard three big booms from the three shots I got off with my, with my uh, um, M14. Um, but all that happened in you know, seconds, yeah. as, as you know how that goes. And so this guy disappears, drops. I don't know if I've hit him. I don't know in the movement what was happening, if, if he you know, was injured, wounded, just scatter and whatever. Um, and then Kyle's at my feet. And basically he is um, bleeding out of four holes. He took that steel core 762 AK round, you know, through one thigh and it went through the inner thigh and tumbled through his second leg. So he had four holes and he just was bleeding out. So uh, I was curious about, uh, it sounds like that was ball ammo then. Yeah. Did, were, did you guys, I know you found a lot of uh, ammo that didn't match up to guns or, or you know found different armaments were they using any uh, higher speed you know hollow point or you know designed to do more damage than just tumble ball ammo or, or later on we would see that yeah. and it, it would depend on the weaponry we'd find you know um, sometimes in the heavier grows with the more armed groups that were more violent um, a lot of SKS, AK-47s, and some of it was, you know, the, the lead tipped, yeah. so it was an expanding hunting round that would yeah. do more tissue damage. Um, I saw that in some ARs. Yeah. You know, it wasn't just FMJ, 55 grain stuff. It was some of that 64 grain PowerPoint, you know, lead headed, made yeah. to expand. Um, and that all came down to how they were preparing, right? Yeah. Um, and we, it, would just, it would just vary. So we, we started to see, especially the last five years when, when MET was in its heyday, yeah. just more aggressive ammunition and more firearms geared toward anti-personnel, not like you know the 22 long rifle that's yeah. a squirrel gun that they happen to have in the grow. Yeah. So it was that type of deal. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. So shit goes down in a matter of seconds. A couple of their guys are down. One of your guys is down. Um, he obviously made it. Uh, can you walk us through how, how that Yeah, that up? was, so for the next three hours, we waited for an air rescue. And I'm working with my partner and trying to keep him from bleeding out. We had minimal trauma supplies at the time. Um, all that good combat trauma data from, you know, the battle, you, you know, your team members were fighting overseas. We didn't have a lot of that yet. That was 05. Yeah. So this changed our trauma medicine program, obviously, with what the story I'm going to tell next. But essentially, we used all the battle dressings we had. Um, to slow the bleeding down, not completely stop it, keep him from going into shock. And as a testament to Mojo, um, his will, his mental toughness for being a new guy, he was pissed off. He didn't want to be a victim. Um, he wasn't fighting out of fear. He was fighting out of anger. He was protecting the team and not just himself. And when he dropped and couldn't hold up his big 11-pound M1A scout, he dropped that, pulled his Glock, and kept one hand on the inner thigh where the biggest hole in the, most of his bleeding was. Yeah. And he covered all of us with his Glock and just got to some concealment. Yeah. And when we ended up together, I ended up, you know, obviously treating him for trauma med all day while we waited for that air rescue, while we put a tight 360 perimeter up. We knew we had one guy down. We might have a second guy down. We were all tr trained in tactical tracking for armed suspects, but none of us could go after him. We were too yeah. small of a team. So finally, after all of the confusion with administration of how do we get a you know, chopper in there, who's going to come rescue you, you know, certain air support assets saying we don't fly into a hot zone, we're a fire chopper, or we work for this company, you know, whatever, um, we had no idea you know, that a counter drug PAFOC would have come in and flown in hot if they were at Moffett Field spooled up 20 minutes away, yeah. or a California Highway Patrol helicopter, or the Coast Guard, that all changed. So, um, but so we, you guys didn't have like a dedicated medevac plan for something like that happening? We, we had a medevac plan, but it was the wrong people. Yeah. You know, our admin, basically the Sheriff's Administration, because it was their operations plan, and again, we're helping them as, as wardens from the state do this mission, their plan was that, hey, if you have a problem, we'll call Life Flight. Or we'll go up and you know back you up on foot. Well, even though we weren't a great, we were about a mile up that that ridge line, maybe a mile and a half. 
it was like this on a hundred degree August day. So yeah, straight up. Yeah, you're not gonna run a medical team up there fast enough. Yeah. And when you call life flight, you get an ambulance with a blade. They can't yeah. land and they don't have, you know, short haul capability or long yeah. line capability. I mean, they need a flat surface to land on. So we need a bird that had a hoist in a basket. Yeah. And it ended up being a Cal Fire, you know, one of the forestry choppers that finally came in. And, you know, I put out the radio call and they said, well, we can't come in until the whole hill is secure. And I said, you know what, guys, we're secure. <laughs> yeah. This this hill is Shit's secure. Shit's good. Come on in. Shit's good because yeah. my partner's dying and yeah. I was frustrated. I was calling their dispatch and um, the sheriff's deputies, um, Rails and Snake, their code names. They were both, you know, yeah. doing some radio traffic with their people and we were getting on cell. We had cell phone coverage so I could yeah. make calls. Um, but the choppers that kept coming over that day were that we kept, you know, expending our uh, our smoke canisters on to give them our location for yeah. a rescue. They were news choppers. Yeah, Jesus. So we had Bay Area news choppers. We got national <laughs> news. And, if you know, it bleeds, it leads, right? It bleeds, <laughs> it leads, brother. And you know, they were putting Fuck. out you know bad information. So yeah. long story. Um, we got him off the hill. He went into surgery. Had an agonizing recovery, but thankfully recovered. Did you guys tourniquet him or no? Um, we did. Yeah. Yeah. We did as best we could. Yeah. And we did. Uh, um, and we didn't have designated tourniquets. We just used, you know, Israelis and, yeah. and, and gauze to go as tight as we can. Yeah. Now, obviously, we're running two tourniquets, yeah. a dirty and a, st and a secondary and, yeah. you know, um, anticoagulant. Core and clot and, type stuff. Yeah, yeah. and every, everything that, that um, you know, that the military teams do. And yeah. we're, we're versed in it now. But, but that was real new. But when we saw that, that level of danger and aggressiveness from mm -hmm. these guys... And again, all that environmental crime. Yeah. So I saw, you know, dead animals and I saw that white sheen that was on those plants. And we still didn't know at the time that that was that carbofreeran that I'm yeah. sure we'll talk about later oh, when we yeah. get into the new book. Um, but right then I, I knew this is the biggest environmental criminal we have in California. And yeah. I know they're not just in California. Yeah. And for game wardens not to be involved in this fight is a travesty. Yeah. We need to stay in the fight if we're really going to protect our wildlife anywhere in the country. And this is com this is not a typical poacher we can do from a patrol deputy standpoint. We need an ops team yeah. dedicated and supported. Yeah. And that was the big battle for 10 years to get Met going. So on that operation specifically, obviously you guys engaged several of their dudes. Did you guys ever find out if... Uh, I mean, did you ever catch those guys? you ever know what happened to them or what? We, we know there were more than two. Um, we didn't catch anybody else. We had some intel that one of them was injured severely um, and made it back to Mexico. And we had one that was that didn't make it out of the gross site that was neutralized. Oh, no shit. Yeah. Like you found his body later. We did, we yeah. did find his body, yeah, yeah. and forensics uh, got that. And, and that was one of those things when you start talking about being a hand loader and into ballistics and a sniper and all that stuff, we start talking about, you know, ammunition's effectiveness in brushy, manzanita, heavily wooded conditions. And yeah. That was where we were on the fence because my partners with their 5.56s, five even with those 64 grain power points, which are pretty good penetrating 5.56 five rounds, um, Snake and Apache fired about 19 rounds, you know, from those weapons. Mm -hmm. And two of them made it in to get heart and lung shots to take down that guy that had that yeah. shotgun trained on us. And it wasn't because they were bad shots or anticipating. It's just because there was a lot of deflection. Yeah. They were having to shoot through small limbs, manzanita branches, leaves. It's just so dense. Yeah. And um, even our big 308s, you know, they were penetrating better. But but still, we you know we had that issue of penetration in those environments. So have you guys done any ballistics uh, work with any FBI stats? Or I, I guess it, it my my first thought is I know Hornady makes those critical defense and yes. critical duty rounds that are pretty good at, at penetrating a bunch of shit, slanted glass. Yeah. Uh, or auto, auto slant. Is that something you guys use? Or we do. We yeah. do. Um, right now, we've 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 used Hornady for some of our indoor entry stuff. And and when we got met, we got to really get picky. You know, and myself and a lot of the gun guys on the team brought that in where like on snipers, we have barrier rounds. Our standard duty round out of our POF, our standard entry carbine is still a 7.62 yeah. and it's a bonded, you know, lead mm -hmm. to core projectile. So it penetrates really well, expands really well. Um, we have some lighter stuff for indoors that'll fragment versus yeah. over penetrating walls. Yeah. But the stuff we use for Matt and the reason we stayed with the bigger and heavier 7.62 is because of the lack of penetration issues we had with the lighter calibers yeah. when, we're in, when we're in that dense brush of Manzanita, yeah. You guys messed at all with, I know it's, it's a, a more controversial uh, platform, but the 300 Blackout at all, some of the you know, more we, lighter? 
I'll tell you, man, since uh, becoming a Montana resident, I have my first blackout. Yeah, I, lo I love it. I love that caliber. Yeah. And it, it, it seems it's like funny it'd be a good fit for you guys. Though. You hit it on the head, brother. It would be the ideal Met caliber in a small platform yeah. that hits hard. You know, out like to a nine inch PDW kind of thing. It would be a perfect and for our canine guys. Yeah. The biggest thing is our canine guys don't normally push that big, big, yeah. uh, you know, fourteen point five inch POF just because even we have the new lightweight revolutions, yeah. Yeah. and they're still pretty featherweight. They're too, they're too cumbersome for a canine guy to handle with a dog. Yeah. Yeah. So we always got to have a rifle or a secondary handgun or both with our canine handler yeah. on a deployments. But I see that blackout, like you're saying, Mike, is really the ideal med gun. And you know, I, I tell my guys in California when I see them and we, we get together and hang out periodically and they're like, oh man, yeah, <laughs> wish we could have that. You know? I'll I tell you, if, if I was a canine handler in that environment, I would roll a, uh, a Sig Sauer, the five and a half inch uh, cane break, 300 blackout yep. and, and use like 110, 120 grain. Cause the you're- barns? Uh, yeah. Well, shit, any of them, but- yeah. Because you're still getting rifle velocity of you know 14, 1500 foot pounds of of energy dumped into a target and and, and a lot of penetration and with a it out sweet, of a big small bullet, tight it. little package. You know, yeah. it's, it's kind of a, a good mix of that that happy medium between five five six and seven six two. But it is, and it's funny you mentioned the the Rattler, <clears throat> but that's the system I just acquired. Oh, I love that one ten. Yeah, I, I have it. one. Yeah, yeah, I love I'm it. Training on it all the time, yeah. and uh, running that one ten is the way we go yeah. too. No, so that's, that's badass. Now we're now we're getting off into the woods <laughs> like a bunch of ballistic <laughs> dorks. But um, anyway, it. we'll bring it back to the a little more mainstream sure. here. But uh, w one question I did have: I it, the entire book talks about outdoor grow facilities. Did you? I mean. Were there any indoor grow facilities involved yes. in, in some of these? And, and, Absolutely. And the other, the other question, uh, well, I'll let you speak to that first, I guess. What, what? Yeah, there's there's a distinction we got to kind of put out of, you know, l legalized, legit cannabis. A lot of it is indoors. And then there's still the whole cartel infiltration into indoor grows. Yeah. And what we saw when we, we regulated in California a couple years ago, the beginning of it, and we saw this before regulation started, um, somebody would get a cannabis growing license, right? And it would be a landowner, maybe a vacant, vacant landowner, a leasee, if you will, or whatever. And then a bunch of guys would come in and just kind of take that over under, you know, under, sanctioned by a landowner, yeah. even absentee. And it might be 20 cartel growers that just worked in the deep forests, but now they can kind of do it a little easier. They're not going to get a lot of heat because it is regulated now and this person's applied for a permit. Mm. So we, um, especially my last year of ops in 2018, we did a monster one in the city of Galt, which is kind of the central hot valley near Sacramento. And it was in excess of four or five greenhouses. It was like, I don't know, 70, 80,000 plants. Jesus. It was a mongo. And we had, it was one of the coolest canine ops though that I've been on because we had our two canines some federal LEO canines that our canines have worked with extensively, you know, for this particular type of bad guy. And I, I want to say we probably had seven or eight dogs on that mission, Jesus which, Christ. which was an armada, yeah. you know, for our Fuck ops yeah. to have that many dogs. So it was, <laughs> yeah. it was canine heavy and we yeah. were like loving fucking it. Fucking sled dogs running around. Yeah, it was sled dogs. We could have <laughs> <laughs> could have gone sled dog. <laughs> could have, could have drugged your ass into the fucking Oh my gross gosh, side. Mike, it was cool. But, yeah. and they deployed, they were running all over because yeah. these guys, God, you know, so they, fucking cool. they were like rats leaving a ship and we, yeah. when we hit all those greenhouses and they were yeah. running out in these farm fields just for miles. Do you guys but, carry a... Uh, Body cams, is any of that on fucking, do you have any footage? You know, some agencies do. Yeah. Um, our, our agency is trying to, my chief, uh, Dave, is, is working real hard to get body cams, and, and we're going to see that happen. And I think fuck, that would be cool to see. It would be good, it's it just good for, you're right, it would yeah. be good on every level to have that yeah. um, and go back and have that, you know, for liability reasons, <clears throat> but just to record, like you're saying, the event. Yeah, a lot of less good lessons learned canine-wise to see absolutely that many dogs going uh, at the same time. But uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, but so the indoor stuff um, definitely does happen, and it all depends. I mean, you got to think that these these DTO group, these cartel groups, are very smart about. You know, they're going to do what's most effective. Mm -hmm. It's it's a cash business, yeah. and they're very you know organized in the business model of cost benefit analysis. And if they don't have to risk being eight miles into the backcountry, yeah. and risk a canine savvy team like ours or Forest Service were teamed up with coming in and taking them down. I mean, that could be a $20 million loss for them. A couple of their guys are probably going to be out of circulation for a good long time, if not indefinitely, from some yeah. canine bites deployed properly. Yeah. Um, but if they can do it indoors and, uh, and get away with it, they can, they can produce more. So now we have the private land issue and the public land issue. And when I, my last year of ops, when I keep all those stats, right, for the monthly report and the annual, um, it was interesting because we were exactly a 50-50 split of private land 
indoor or private land outdoor. Oh wow! And uh, and strictly public land parks, forests, yeah. and things like that. So. And I'm finding, I just came from the NUIA conference, which is the uh, National Game Wardens Conference, and spoke to them on this and presented. And um, I'm finding states like Oklahoma, Wisconsin, these guys are getting the same cartels now. And as Hidmore goes into at the end, you know, with some of the, the appendix stuff yeah. of making sure people realize this isn't a California problem. The hub of it's there because we're a Mediterranean weed state and we grow yeah. really good weed in Cali, but it's in every state to some extent. Yeah. And methamphetamine, fentanyl, human trafficking. I mean, these guys are embedded in every state mm -hmm. of the union. Yeah. Um, and other states are starting to experience it now too yeah. on private land as well. But one thing on the on the private land, um, in terms of the big outdoor grow operations that you encountered, some of them obviously were on private land. Were some of them on private land and, and that private land owner was naive that, that they were on there or were they all in on it? You know, it, it's mixed. We've had a couple of situations, and I'll, I'll have a little war story to talk about the private land guy that actually sanctioned it and had a kickback coming. But nine times out of ten, what we've been able to ascertain is they don't know. Yeah. Um, like these guys. How, think, the, how the fuck do you not know that? Well, that's the crazy part, you know, because some of these guys have 10, 15,000 acre ranches. They're cattle ranches, right? Um, they're also like black tailed deer hunting clubs or maybe, you know, wild hog hunting clubs. And until they get into the deepest reaches of where their water sources are, where these grows set up, um, they're not aware of them. Yeah. Most of the time, at least over 60, 70 percent of the time, by one season of them going, someone on their ranch that's either out running cattle or he's hunting a hog or a deer, they're going to smell it or they're going to see a sign of it or they're going to cut a track or we're going to find it. Yeah. But these cartel guys were getting really smart at saying, okay, well, well, we'll try it on this ranch. We'll come in off the highway. We'll infringe a little bit and maybe we'll get away with it for a season. And they do. And it might be three, four, five seasons before, and they get greedy and they mm -hmm. start blowing up the operation. Then they finally get so big that they get a little too close to that one Jeep trail yeah. that some guy's going to find. But yeah, I've seen them on, you know, some, and these are ranchers I grew up with actually hunted their property, you know, growing up as a kid. And next yeah. thing I know, we're, we're raiding groves yeah. on their club. And so that's a, that's a hard hit for those guys personally, because yeah. we talked about the reclamation, the EPA thing. Um, nine times out of 10, we won't have a budget or be authorized to reclamate on private land. And we got this great rancher that hosted us, couldn't handle it himself. And, you know, might not have a ton of money in the coffers to do some cleanup. So we'll find a way to go in there and clean up with them. And he'll usually provide a truck or, you know, a, a couple of cowboys and we'll do the cleanup. But they get taxed with this. Yeah. And it's just, it's a real burden. Yeah. That's, it's hard to wrap your mind around, I guess, in explaining it. You know, if you've got that amount of land and it's in some little, you know, remote corner or whatever. But uh, were there instances of uh, private landowners that would, get in, into gunfights with any of the guys or get in, in, into it with them? Well, we had some close calls, yeah. yeah. We got yeah. some guys, you know, that, I mean, you know, true American cowboys, <laughs> hey, it's my property, you know, and hey, I can't believe these guys are here doing this and yeah. they're they're threatening them at gunpoint, you know, the growers are running off. There's been some gunfire exchanged. Yeah. There's been nobody injured that I know of. Yeah. And it, it got to a point when that was kind of out of frustration because those those landowners weren't getting the response quickly. Yeah. And then when they started to get to know us on the Met team, and something that was cool about when we built Met is we have, you know, with, with alternates from patrol and full-time guys, we have, you know, about 12 guys on the team and a couple of really good canines, but they're spread out in a way that they're responsible for a number of counties. And so every county in the state was covered and the response was quick because even though it took a long time to get to the point of having this one-off team, the point was we didn't have any other things we had to work on. We didn't have patrol duties. We weren't FTOs anymore. Yeah. Um, we would still teach where we did. We would still do the outreach we needed to do, but we needed to respond. Yeah. And come grow season between like May and you know September, if a rancher had a problem, we better get there within a day or so, or they were gonna have to take it into their own hands, or they yeah. would go out and try to do something because they had hunters coming, they had cattle moving. Um, so our, our response time was a lot better, yeah. and it, it, it lessened that once the ranchers started to trust and, and know about the team. Yeah, and so speaking of the team, you, you mentioned there's 12 people on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, on a good day. Yeah. <laughs> and the, uh, so that basically was was in response to the August 5th of 05 uh, operation. Now, 
So you're tasked with, uh, with forming this team or, or co-forming this team. Uh, can you talk about kind of getting your feet wet, building that team, getting the initial team together and, and uh, you know, in terms of what worked, what needed, what you needed to be successful and how, how that rolled into, into the full-time gig that it turned into? Sure. And, and I got to go all the way back to, to the 05 shooting. Um, our chief at the time was Nancy Foley and was a big supporter of what we were doing when she saw the environmental damages there. And she and our director at the time, who was an ex-game warden in the directorate, which was really good for us, Ryan <coughs> Broderick, you know, they were in the hospital the whole time. My partner was, was recovering and being operated on. They were there to support us. And the big thing that was coming down from the governor's office and even press crews was, what are game wardens doing on a drug case? Yeah. Why'd they get that kid shot? Mm -hmm. You know, and they, nobody had a clue the environmental impacts. But my chief, Nancy, and bless her for this, stood up on camera with all those press crews in the, in, in the you know, basically in the, in, the, um, in, the, in our base of operations and said, hey, there's environmental crime. Game wardens are there for that reason. That's their mandate. They're tactically trained. I'm real proud of what they did today. They're yeah. trained with the best law enforcement, and we're going to continue doing this. So and she, there, and she there was had, a little bit of heat on that. You know? No, I don't doubt. I mean, in, in true uh, media fashion of, uh, you know, making accusations first and then and then doing the the backstory work later. But right. So she she had the uh, the lady balls and told him to fuck off basically right. I mean, <laughs> in a nutshell, that's yeah, exactly what no, she did. No pun intended, right? Yeah, the, no, that, that's that's perfect. Yeah, no, I mean that that's it's so fucking rare, especially in a state of California. I mean, that's awesome to hear that uh, that she was like, yeah, it's fucking deal with it. I mean, it, I, I don't understand why more not just politicians, but I think more specifically police chiefs and sheriffs yeah. and, and things like that don't do that. They you know the the second they get. Uh, accused of something or somebody you know says something that that maybe shines or or they try to shine a negative light they start to tap dance and back, back and apologize back, back and, yep you know the to me that just, starts yeah it's the wrong fucking answer you know yeah we yep. did it and if we're presented with that same same issue guess what we're gonna fucking do it again yeah you know th there needs to be way more of that um it, it's really refreshing again especially in california to hear that um so that kind of gave you the uh, the the blessing, if you will, to move forward and, and form the team. Or? That that wasn't quite. That was the start. Nancy always believed in the fact that we needed a team. But when my first book came out, um, we had never had a book opportunity like that. You know, where a publisher wanted to do a book deal and and tell the stories, especially from this type of thing. Yeah, it's just non traditional for a game warden story. Um, and you know, and I met with my chief and had one of those long meetings of, hey, you know, we're, we're getting a book deal. Yeah. And obviously the department had to screen it, you know, because I was still employed by the agency. This is going back to 2010. And, um, you know, I wasn't sure how that would go over, especially in our state with the political environment. But yeah. she was super proud. She believed in outreach. She said this is a legitimate part of what we do. It doesn't replace all the other stuff we do because all that traditional patrol is super important. Yeah. We didn't form that to say, hey, we're going to go do the hard job now. And, you know, those patrol guys are just doing the old school stuff that isn't that important. We're just handling now another challenge that game wardens are taxed with, and hence we call ourselves the Thin Green Line. And my whole push right now in retirement nationally is support your Thin Green Line enforcement efforts for the sake of <clears throat> public safety, sovereignty, but also protection of our wildlife, wildlands, and waterways. And like I told Nancy, I said, well, Nance, this is a huge environmental crime that we got to deal with in a different way. So our thin green line's never been thinner because yeah. we're not getting more bodies. Yeah. We're going to pull special operations guys out of patrol. <clears throat> Something's going to give a little bit. Um, and even though she you know, really thought we needed a team, the politics, even within agency, couldn't bear it. Yeah. You know, um, chiefs and captains didn't believe we should be doing this. You know, I was, I was really supported and liked by, you know, some administrators. And I think I was not so much liked and, you know, like kind of a radical cowboy for putting so much emphasis into marijuana enforcement and trying to go play special operator out there. Or so it was perceived, yeah. but it had nothing to do with that. And Nance knew that. Yeah. Nance knew. And that's why I was on our firearms training committee for 18 years of, of advancing our tactics to be ready for any law enforcement situation in or out of a marijuana garden, mm -hmm. but more importantly, if we did get a team. So we didn't have a team yet. Yeah. That was 05. Um, we had another gunfight in 2007, you know, and then another one a couple years after that. And we were getting out of those uninjured, but there were close calls and we didn't have canines yet. Mm -hmm. So we had like brother Brian Boyd up running around with the Shasta County Sheriff's Office 
really seeing the same thing I saw down in the Silicon Valley of now I have an environmental criminal that's the most violent, the most dangerous, it's these cartel guys. They're armed. I'm going after them. Yeah. Because they're making the biggest dent and I can handle this and this is my challenge. Now the risks are higher than usual, but this is what I'm going to do with my sheriff's buddies. But not a lot of other game wardens are helping them out. Yeah. I'm down in Santa Clara County doing my thing with the sheriff's department, developing tactics, using light runner schemes of you know making a couple of us really lightly laden with gear and handguns supported by rifle basically being dogs yeah. and doing the rundowns when we can do it safely um and then a couple uh officers were doing it and then nate arnold now our deputy chief who was a captain at the time was was doing stuff and coordinating operations in, in the fresno king's canyon what we call our central enforcement district but we were all doing it differently you know we were comparing notes a little bit but we were all in districts and we had district boundaries Kind of like mainline forces, you know, you don't go out of your box. And so um, we, I kept po politicking for a team, didn't push too hard because I knew in that administration it wasn't going to happen. Um, and then we were doing more and more of it. More and more guys were getting involved. More gunfights were happening. We were getting really close to getting hurt again. Um, and then Nancy retired, and then Mike Carrion became our chief of patrol. Mike was one of my mentors in the academy. And I can't thank him enough for believing in me all the way back when he trained me on defensive tactics in, two, in 1992. But we developed a friendship over the years. Um, he grew me up to be an instructor to outside agencies as a firearms instructor, a DT instructor. He saw what I was doing in tactics and instead of thinking I was getting radical and being something I wasn't supposed to be as a game warden, he went, wow, that's getting progressive. That's legitimizing us. This is gonna be necessary. And the whole time while all these gunfights were going down and Brian was starting to develop that apprehension program and, and we were getting our canine program back and Phoebe came into the, canine Phoebe came into the mix, um, he was the chief for Brian and those guys up north and he actually broke, broke the mold and let Brian come down with canine Phoebe in 2012 and start working with me, actually 2011 and 2012. And we brought that great canine and Brian's skills to Santa Clara County, the Silicon Valley, they didn't have a dog and never worked around a dog. And then we started getting apprehensions. Yeah. And I go, I, in Hidden War, I know you know one of the chapters goes into that pivotal engagement where Phoebe made a bite. And you see the value of... And everybody saw the value. And when Mike became the chief, he got settled. And I just asked him, I said, can we have a conversation? about next steps when you're settled. He said, sure. And we had an off-campus meeting, myself, Nate Arnold, captain at the time, and we met, uh, met with Mike, breakfast meeting, October of would have been 20, 2012. And we had all the stats from all over the state, or what we thought we had. And we had all these examples of barely getting out safely and things not going so right and not having the right equipment and not having the right training and having to do 5,000 jobs, typical game warden yeah. problem right jack of all trades and uh, mike said so you're propo you're basically proposing a specialized a strike team you want your tactical unit i said yeah and we need to dedicate it to this we need to fight just these dto cartel growers um, we need to bring it all apprehension aggressive canines and everything to the table one team no district boundaries go anywhere we need to go take some pressure off patrol have patrol help us out um, we need helicopter assets, we need medical training, we need better firearms, night vision, we need to do it all. Um, and we need to pick the right guys. Um, and test it out. And Mike said, you know what, let's test it next summer. We'll do a three month pilot program. We'll test you from July to September, um, go three months, and let's see how it goes. And we did, we did that in 2013. And you know, when it comes to picking the guys, that was another thing that was real radical for us because I was picking guys that were the best at what they do. They were really, really accomplished traditional game wardens. Right. I mean, like five, five guys on the team have been officer of the year, mm -hmm. life-saving awards, awards of valor, and completely humble and selfless about it. You know, kind of like picking the right team where you come from and my other SEAL team buddies. It's like, we want the guys with the best skill sets with the least egos yeah. that are about each other first and foremost, and man, Talk about a blessing the last six years of career to work with guys that are my brothers yeah. that are jumping in front of bullets for each other and just with no attitude yeah. and tireless, you know, and those are the guys we were very lucky to get. We yeah. got we got the best we could um, and they like doing this. Not everybody does yeah. in, in my world. Not every warden wants to do this and they shouldn't. Yeah. But but that's how it happened. And Mike really made the next step happen to uh, 
to making the team go. And six weeks into the pilot program, we were running out of money. And Nate and I were, were called up to the mountains to meet with all the chiefs having their quarterly meeting and Mike leading it as the head honcho. And um, we're like, okay, well, we're going to try to ask for some money because we're going seven days a week and we had the military helping us with the PayPot crew out of, out of Moffitt. And, and we got to the meeting and we started to give our pitch and he goes, guys, just stop. We've been talking about marijuana work and what you guys have been doing for the last two hours before you got here. And this is so much better. We want a full-time team, testing protocol. We want you guys out of patrol by January 1st next year. You're going to leave patrol. We'll backfill where we can. You're going to work just for headquarters, and this is how it's going to go. And even Nate and I were looking at each other like, did, well, you won the fucking lottery. Did we just win the lottery? <laughs> did we just get this team? Yeah. And, you know, on the heels of that came a sniper unit I got to form up and was yeah. already teaching sniper craft to other agencies with my sheriff's partners and military partners. And... You know, there was always a need for that, for Overwatch, for high-risk stuff, for in, in grows and out of grows. So we, we jumped right on it. And then having dedicated canines that could go anywhere and train with whoever they wanted had never happened before. Yeah. So we hit the ground running in 2014 full-time, but it really started in 2013 with Mike's blessing, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, it's, it's really neat to hear kind of the, the process with which you know, it, it developed. And for the listener, you know, if there – I have no doubt that there's probably some of you out there – that may even potentially still be questioning the validity of or the necessity for the validity of a program like this. First of all, fucking choke yourself if that's what you're thinking. <laughs> Number two uh, is that if, if you could speak to, and, and this is where I found myself being pissed, and, and I saw the the, the neat um, coming together, if you will, of you know legal growers and fucking drug runners and hippies yeah. and rock climbers and law enforcement all kind of coming together of, of a, a mutual pissed offedness, if you will. And that, and where all of this stems from, not just from, okay, there's uh, drug traffic organization, illegal cartel guys growing weed, like that's bad enough in and of itself, but, but where the real travesty comes in that you'll gleam from, from reading the book and, and what I'd like you to spend a, a couple of minutes on is talking about the environmental damage yeah. that these guys do in, in two main key areas, which is water uh, reclamation or, or diverting of water assets in, a, in an already drought-ridden, uh, bone-dry fucking state to begin with, and then even more so with the illegal pesticides, rodenticides, things yeah. of that nature that they're smuggling from Mexico that are enormously fucking catastrophic and, and that they're in the, the tons of gallons. Right. Can, can you speak to, to those two key areas that, that really justifies putting this level of, of asset and, and manpower and resources behind to combat? For sure. And, you know, and I get that California is going to be an example of this because it's so widespread. But um, again, we got national impacts on our waterways, like you just mentioned, Mike, and these banned poisons are everywhere in the country. So up until about 2014, 2015, we didn't know the magnitude of how much water these guys divert for these grows. So when we were in our peak drought, and this was one of the biggest droughts California's had in a century, and you know Texas has droughts and Montana has droughts and all, all the states go through it. But the thing about it is we didn't have the science to quantify how much water they need for these marijuana plants. And in a hot outdoor grow where most of these cartel grows are, you're talking 9,500 degree days through that whole 90 day window for that one harvest to happen. Um, you're looking at 10 to 12 gallons of water per day per plant. An average grow is 5,000 plants yeah. for 90 days. And that's kind of a small grow. We get a 20,000 plant grow, 90 days at 10 to 12 gallons a plant. You're talking hundreds of millions of gallons, yeah. you know, from just a few grows of the water these guys are diverting, right? Whether it's a drought or not, that's catastrophic. Um, and then not only are you stealing all that water that our resources need, whether it's farming, wildlife, drinking water, and drinking water, we had, you know, Native American tribes in Humboldt County in 2014 when we were starting the MET program in peak drought, literally a couple days from turning on their faucets and not having drinking, cooking, or showering water because cartel growers were pulling so much water from the rivers that are now dry, they're getting the underground sources. So that's a huge issue. Um, and not only are they stealing it, but they're diverting it. So they're, they're drying up a creek that could be two, three, 10, 20 miles long within days. Yeah. So everything in that, in that watershed is gonna die. Um, when you talk about the banned poisons, they've been here for 20 years. We really started to learn the magnitude of 
how dangerous they, they are about 10 years ago. Then we started to get even more science about five years ago when they started to show up not in one out of every two cartel grows, but about nine out of 10 cartel grows. And they're, carbo, they're called carbofuran. Yeah. They're um, trade names like Metafos, Qfuran, Furidan. And essentially, they were banned by the EPA 20 years ago because they're so toxic. It's a felony to possess them in anywhere in the US. And they're now still made in third world countries. So all those cartel elements get them out of Tijuana primarily. And the only thing they have to smuggle besides their tier one vetted growers across our border very easily is the poisons. The guns, the infrastructure, the water pipe, the site location, all the camping supplies, the marijuana seeds and clones, that's all supplied. It's all embedded here, but they have to bring those poisons with them. So they're like a, a big high dollar commodity to bring in like a 12, 16 ounce container of this stuff. So we started to see that extensively way back in the beginning. We didn't know how toxic it was. Um, for, to put it in perspective, like this water bottle you know, I'm drinking from is a little smaller than a carbofuran container, but it's kind of a crystalline powder form until it's diluted with water. Then it, it, it mixes like a pink drink. And I have some pictures in the book, as you saw, yeah. looks like a pink energy drink, anything but. But one container, if you took an equal amount of minute doses, would kill 2,600 people fatally if they just ingested it. Yeah. Um, this stuff was made direct, uh, originally for one container, say 12 ounce container to mix with somewhere in excess of 5,000 gallons of water before it would get sprayed on legitimate agriculture crops. And that was determined by the EPA to be toxic. These guys mix it in three to five gallon backpack sprayers. This stuff is nasty. Yeah. And we've got trail camera footage or, or selfies from cell phones of these cartel growers, even like Silicon Valley, by Yosemite National Park, Whiskey Town National Park, I mean, all over the state and in other states where there they are with their backpack sprayer in full camos. It's going all over the plants, all over the flower and the bud that people are smoking on the black market, kids in the Midwest, because that's where all this stuff goes, on the soil, it's in the water, and they're posing with all the dead animals they've killed. I've got a picture, and it's in the book, of one grower that we caught a year later. I had to tackle him with one of those backpack sprayers on. Unfortunately, didn't, we didn't get contaminated because it stayed contained. But um, we found his phone from a grow the year before, and there he is smiling with a golden eagle, you know, a protected raptor yeah. with one that came in, ingested some of that water, part of the plant, and within minutes, just the active ingredient in this stuff is a nerve agent that the Nazis developed in World War II. So it's basically a, a nerve toxicant that you just seize up and you're done. Yeah. So nasty, nasty stuff. And what people need to realize is this is on a, a large majority, if not most, and almost all of all the black market cannabis that's going all over America, not only from California, but grown in all the other states too. Yeah. And it's 25, 27% THC, it's really potent. People don't know what they're ingesting. It's about half the cost of organic certified dispensary weed. And you're just, you know, you're, you're smoking a slow death. Yeah. Kids, kids and, and medical patients. Yeah. Well, and again, reading the book, you know, the, those two, two components, you know, the water and the, and the environmental hazard through the poisons is something that, again, I never thought fucking twice about, you know, when it came to illegal growth. Right. I, think I most had no people idea don't. when I started doing it. Yeah. Crazy. And seeing the pictures of fucking cougars and, and bear, mm -hmm. you know, female bears with their cubs, fucking dead, poisoned, just, I mean, you guys ran Freaking into horrible. all over the place. Yeah. And, and to me, like, if you're listening, if, if nothing else pisses you off, that fucking ought to piss you off. Uh, you know, to see scores and scores of, you know, some of these endangered and protected yeah. species, you know, big, beautiful, majestic creatures that are, that are being poisoned to death because these people are, are growing weed as well as poisoning the weed and, and flooding the U.S. market, giving everybody fucking cancer. But, um, <laughs> you know, so, yeah, it's, it's really nasty shit. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a really neat, uh, you know, story about uh, combating it. Uh, as you guys, you know, so you get fully sanctioned now, uh, you hit the ground running, the two things that you alluded to that we'll dive right into that uh, became really necessary components to your team and, and force multipliers were the canine teams and the sniper elements. And yeah. what's neat in reading this this book and, and seeing the parallels between really a, a, a no-shit special operations unit is, is you know, you, you guys mirrored 
uh, you know, both in necessity and operationally, you know, what a special operations unit in the military is in terms of needing kind of that all encompassing, right. you know, the right weaponry, the right guys, the right training, the right platforms, the, the air assets, the, uh, you know, different components of the team, i.e. canine and, and sniper overwatch to be able to, to truly be effective at combating some of these guys and the tactics that they're using. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to talk about the canine teams first because I'm a fucking canine guy. That's what I, like. <laughs> I can't wait for that. Um, yeah. You know, so if oh, you could yeah, talk about uh, the the canine experiences and, and the full force multiplier that they brought to the table and, and uh, bring bring the listener up to speed all things canine. Yeah, canines. I mean, again, we could talk about canines for days, man. Uh, the experience you have and 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 how much you love your dogs and, and what you're doing great on the canine front and, and really what our department's doing. And it really started about 2007, 2008. So the um, Mission Croy Road Op? Mission Croy Road Op. Yeah, that was a 2012 op. Um, that was the one mission where canine Phoebe and, and her handler, Brian Boyd, came down to help out. And they were helping the Santa Clara County operation that, that the Santa Clara County sheriffs were running. We didn't have our formalized team yet, so we were, you know, we were members of the team, equals, but from the game warden front. And Brian had, he was becoming kind of legendary. I mean, he and Phoebe had developed into a well-oiled machine. They had that symbiotic relationship that I read about in your books with your handlers and yeah. you, you know, you with Reno and, and the different dogs, man. Um, it was one of those just, you know, one in a thousand, one in a million canine handler combinations. They just bonded instantly. Now, when they started, and I want to backstory it a little bit because I think everybody will appreciate this, there was a lot of trial and error, you know. We were coming from different techniques and different trainers of how to certify these dogs. And, you know, these are mostly Belgian males like we use on, you know, your special forces dogs. And um, they're trained in scent detection and everything else in, in addition to biting when they need to. And Phoebe had all of that going on, but she tested really well in kind of rural flatlands and rolling hills in an urban environment because <clears throat> at the time it was mostly police canine apprehension, dual purpose dog training, and we trained like police do. Mm -hmm. But then we had to go out into the game warden world and not only work on a track for a poached animal in the woods, but now you're going after cartel guys and it's 100 degrees and you know, scent is doing weird things when things heat up. And you know it's it's hard on the dogs, yeah. you know, because it's a long day. Um, just hydrating them can be a problem, and then identifying that type of suspect through all of that cover, and not misidentifying that suspect, you know, and biting one of our officers. Yeah. And um, Phoebe had for the first couple of years, she never been an officer. She was one of those dogs that had like Goldilocks, not too hard, not too soft. She yeah. was really social, had great prey drive. You know, her ball drive was great. Um, she did really well. But she was missing bad guys, some of these guys, because she was just getting a glimpse of them, losing sight of them, maybe getting confused with other officers, terrain obstacles, or whatever the case may be. But after a training that Brian kind of had to ad hoc himself, and he kind of worked himself into being our lead trainer in the agency um, for that particular mission, she just became the 100% dog. Yeah. You know, I mean, certainly she would miss a bite if a guy got you know, slipped down a trail or she got into an obstacle or it was a longer deployment. But very often than not, um, especially toward the last five years of her career, um, she never missed a bite. Yeah. The cool thing about that dog, and it just, uh, you know, we lost her to leukemia here in, in, uh, just last year, just last July in, in 2018. Um, and, uh, you know, we knew it wasn't going to last forever. Yeah. And the fact that she got 12 years of operations in those conditions was was a miracle. And, you know, we were, we were, uh, we were betting against time, yeah. And we and, and when we when we lost her, but a lot more on her. Well, yeah. To see you know 116 bites, <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, for for anybody listening outside the canine industry, I mean, that's you you really almost don't ever hear that. Uh, you know, where a canine has that many certified legitimate fucking live bites. You know, there's been some. Some soft dogs that you know have done seven, yeah. eight, nine fucking deployments in Afghanistan and Iraq that have triple digit you know bite numbers, but you know in in the the full spectrum of of the canine industry that that's an absurd amount of it's crazy. of apprehensions yeah. and and yeah. you know it's it's again it's just really cool to to read all the stories the um, the sizzle reel video that we'll include uh, if if we with your permission if Absolutely. we can on the. Uh, when we when we post and promote the show, we'll we'll include that, and, and it shows her 
or, or dogs, generally speaking, uh, in this environment working that uh, that I think paints a pretty good picture as to a the environment that they're working in and how challenging it can be, but b also just the the good work that those dogs are putting in. Um, you know that environment we were talking about it before we sat down. You know, is is absolutely a challenging environment. Were there um, protocols that you guys had to kind of learn the the hard way, in terms of you know once you put that that dog through its initial academy with the handler and and they're certified and ready to go you know live on the street so to speak, uh, or in the field in this case. Um, can you talk us through some of the challenges of of incorporating them in early on and, and some of the problems that you that you encounter? Yeah, for sure. Um, getting back to how we how we got Phoebe really dialed up as that premier dog, it was training her in those environments we worked, mock grow sites, um, clothing and scent. You know that that these growers wear, and obviously a certain smell that develops when they're living, and they're living nomadically in these encampments in hot days five, six, seven months straight if they're not caught. So, you know, developing around clothing from the dog or, you know, from the growers, different, uh, you know, instruments that that are in those camps and just getting our dogs familiar with that environment and putting them through, you know, our testing facility and the facility we train on for, for MET, for our dogs and our operators is, it's a real sight. Yeah. I mean, we take them through Manzanita trails and they go on a long hike and, you know, they got to, you know, follow man tracks or the dog has to follow a scent on those man tracks and then get into a grow site where you have all these, uh, you know, visual obstructions and physical obstructions and going through Manzanita tunnels and down rocks and, and then finding a guy that's, you know, in a bite suit, obviously, and, and doing a canine apprehension style. But reacting like these guys do yeah and the hard part about it is is obviously these guys have a lot to lose and everything to gain they have everything to gain if they can get away from the dog yeah. and they know that so they fight a lot yeah you know even under a, a, a good dog with a good bite and phoebe bit hard you mm -hmm. know and some of our bigger dogs bite a little harder but um these guys you know they'll hit them with rocks they'll stab them i mean we did, we started to see our dogs and our federal partners dogs getting so effective from about 2015 2016 on the cartels knew that, and they knew that if a team comes in with a dog and they're a tight team, it's going to be a bad day. Yeah. And more and more grows were being lost. More and more growers were being lost to bites. So they developed tactics to, you know, have one of their guys take a bite, and instead of pulling a gun, and probably a little bit longer deployment before we're catching up to that dog, those guys would take that bite on the arm or in the shoulder or in the leg, and then they'd have a fixed blade knife, you know, eight to 10 inches, or maybe a carved deer bone sheath, or, you know, a um, little shank, and go for that jugular vein. And we lost a federal dog to a stabbing that was an effective dog. That puts the halt on a team's operations. They know that, yeah. you know, trips everybody up. Um, we had another federal dog, a, a great partner dog that was uh, stabbed almost critically, survived surgery, came back to work. Um, and Phoebe was, you know, I'm a football fan, and I think of NFL concussion protocol. Yeah. That crazy fur missile of ours, <laughs> she must have been in, Mike, no joke. She was in concussion protocol, I can think of six or seven times throughout her career. Wow. She was getting hit with rocks and shit. She was hit with rocks, or they, you know, they'd take a big hatchet, or they grab like a, a pan or, or some big heavy implement, a big, big heavy, you know, dense wood log or something in camp on these runouts. And what we noticed um, that was really interesting when we were filming Wild Justice. Phoebe would have like a GoPro type or contour camera on her, and sometimes she would stay on a pursuit, and the guy would shake her, but she wouldn't give up. And we might be, you know, a little too far behind that dog. And Brian's fast, but he's not a 32 mile an hour fast guy yeah. chasing that chasing yeah. that fur missile. And by the time he catches up, she's got him, but she's a little shaken, not quite acting herself. And what's up, sweetie? You know. And then we go back and look at the footage, and um, you know, you just see the blows. Skillet. Yo, you see the blows coming to her head yeah. from a big piece of granite. You see the blade coming out. Yeah. I mean, she was taking hits. Yeah. And it made us realize that the time that dog is away from us for even a couple of seconds, and that suspect might be screaming or going silent if he's a real tough one. Yeah. There's all kinds of drama going on the dog, so it gets to change in tactics, shorter deployments. Um, we are we are right on our dogs, and after ha losing a few, yeah. you know, but you could see what effect they were having yeah. for for these guys to actually take a hard bite, avoid getting shot and pulling a gun, yeah. and then go ahead and try to take that bite and take that dog out. They don't, you know they they knew it was that that effective. Yeah, or uh, or your dogs typically not wearing vests because of the heat. Uh -huh. Usually that's it, yeah. and and I get that question a lot by guys in the know, yeah. and we do have vests for them. Yeah. We have some of the best. Um, 
you know, we have the best equipment. And, yeah. and really, when you mentioned how the team was formed, um, my whole thing was there's no reason a domestic game warden team with these guys' skill sets and their commitment to the job can't train on par with like a SEAL team. Yeah. And having a 20-year veteran SEAL on the team yeah. um, and having the best trainers on the team, we wanted our dogs to be trained at the highest level with the highest and best equipment. And by the time I left the team, when money was starting to come in, we were getting the lightest body armor, yeah. really good night vision. But still, it, it's if we're doing a short yeah. well, grow early in the morning or we're doing a, an urban raid on a home, the dogs are always armored up. Yeah. And they are armored anytime we can in the woods. But the yeah. heat, as you know, is just, yeah. it's going to crush them. Yeah, I mean, even, you know, I don't know if you guys have messed with Canine Storm at all. They've got a, a yeah. stab proof and, and ballistic vest that's probably, as far as I know, is the lightest out there. And it's a lot lighter than everything by quite a bit. Yeah, we're actually running the storm. Yeah, yeah it's a great, great stuff. Great company, great stuff. Can't recommend yep. it enough. It's uh, pricey, but you get what you pay for. Right. Uh, well worth it, in my opinion. But the problem mm -hmm. is, is that... You know, while that's fucking way better than nothing, that's not a guarantee either, you know, and it's not going to protect a, exactly. a cast iron skillet over, <laughs> right. over the fucking melon either, you right. know. So, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah, and, and it doesn't really get much of their neck protected. And, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, they're, uh, for sure I'd rather have them than not. But then again, you're, you've are you got that balancing act of, you know, it's 107 fucking degrees and, and now you're, call. you're covering the entire dog's body also, even if it's light. It's it's still extra material yeah. and, and weight and, and whatever else, you know, so it, it is a tough, uh, tough balancing act. Um, were there any, I, I know the you talk about the first season where Canine Champ came on and, and had some missed deployments or, or yeah. missed engagements and then uh, kind of, you know, went back to square one and came back and has, has been an impressive uh, force multiplier yeah, for a number of years. Yeah, he's a rock star now. these days. He's um, doing great, yeah. Would you say that there were a number of dogs where their first few deployments or even the first season they, they were struggling with uh, with that? or, or Very much be, so. Because of the – has the – is that – Pre, uh, when you had this mock grow facility, or since since the invent of that, has, has that curbed a lot of? It's curbed a lot of it if the if it's the right dog. Yeah, you know, and like like I read in your book and how well you articulate the differences in dogs. I think somebody that really doesn't know, you know, operational canines to do the hard jobs they got to do, whether it's apprehension or detection or whatever in the, in the environments you and I have both worked in. Um, you can have the best trainer, you can do the best training, we can do a mock grow, we can train them for months. Yeah. And sometimes they just don't have the spirit. Yeah, you so. know, and we've, and we've had some brother in the agency that are apprehension dogs, but you get them in a grow and they freeze up yeah. or they, they hesitate halfway into the deployment. And these are, you know, these are really, these are the vi most violent of the violent like we've talked about. So there's no room for a hesitation yeah. of a dog. We need that. Yeah, just like that perfect balance of dog. Yeah. And Phoebe was that, and it took her a while to get there. Yeah. Um, like you mentioned, Champ, um, there's a dog that had it. He just needed the time. Yeah. And, you know, we were so pressed to get Phoebe after she was at, she was at about, well, she was at 114 bites, I think was her number. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, we had eight or nine, uh, 900 arrests where she bathed the guy and the guys gave up. Yeah. So, so, you know, she did a lot of arrests outside of having to bite, which was cool. Um, I had to out her a couple of times when Brian was tied up on an armed suspect and um, getting into a quick dog story and it will relate to this question. Um, getting a dog that won't have to be hard outed will always come off on the, on the out command, even in the most crazy situation. She was that one. Champ, some other harder dogs, not so much. It took a while to get there. Yeah. But we just wanted to see Phoebe healthy and make retirement because she was old. Yeah. You know, she was up there at you know, 12 years old. And, but she was the best dog we had yeah. and, and, you know, business wasn't stopping for the cartels. So she ended up, like you mentioned earlier, going back to work, coming out of retirement. And we took that retired annuitant back in yeah. to work a season. So champ needed a one season yeah. and, um, and she got through that season safely, got to 116, um, got to deploy with her on that last bite, that last mission. And then we, you know, semi-retired her and before she got sick, yeah. but, um, to your point, that's exactly the situation. Um, Champ had it in him. He just needed time to get there. Yeah. And he needed a handler that understood him and didn't push him too hard to break him, just like you write about in your book. Yeah. So my handlers now are all about your book. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm just letting you know. <laughs> and, awesome. um, and we're going to do more with that, man, you yeah. know, off the air. But yeah. um, but that's it's just so tough, man, in yeah. the business. No, it is. It's, I they mean, they're, they're animals, you know. They're, and yeah. you can't explain shit to them and find yeah. them that... That happy medium, it, uh, you know, we, we use the term unicorn a lot, you know, right. in, in the industry. That one in a million. Yeah, right? it really is. It's hard to find. 
Um, a couple of things that I, I thought were fascinating and really cool to to read about, and if you could speak to it a little bit, is is some of the multi bite uh, engagements or deployments yeah. where you know on on one grow bust a dog is getting two, three, four bites. And, yeah. <laughs> can, can you share one story where there was a multiple bite? Uh, I I sure will. We had um, I, well, we have a, a couple different instances where Phoebe, in her career, she got. She got doubles, a lot of doubles, where we would go in quietly and we work, you know, just very safely. We get in quiet. And the, if these guys are spread out, you know, maybe you have some in a camp, maybe you have some in a grow, maybe some coming down the trail. We just, you know, get them quietly in custody. And we know that the way the topography is, it's amazing how much noise you think you make, but no one hears it with wind. Yeah. Right. With uh, with rolling hills and where you happen to be in the wind stack. Um, and we were doing well that one there in uh you know the santa cruz county one i talk about in sierra azul that massive one that was uh, no doubt in my mind it was the same organization that ran the one that shot my partner in 2005 now they're just over the hill in santa cruz county because no one's enforcing it over there and we get in there and we had three missions in there in three years every season and it was always what we kind of called asshole alley up in that area we, that <laughs> Sounds was our like term. somewhere i'd live right you know right mike it was just <laughs> red hot it was asshole alley all those growers were violent. They never wanted to give up. They were either going to fight us with fists, they were going to pull knives, or it was going to be guns. So when I would plan missions with the team on that, it was like, okay, this needs to be a dog festival. So we'll, yeah. take, we'll take Brian's dog, and then we have Nick, right? Buck, our new handler. And he you know, groomed up under, under Brian a little bit. Outstanding handler, has a great dog. So we got two of our dogs on point doing their thing. And then we bring in the sheriff's office and we bring in, you know, um, the Santa Clara dog who Brian and Phoebe and our team helped kind of groom up and train with. And now they're out there, an amazing, you know, male, big, big, big biter. Yeah. Good guy, you know, more drive than, you know, the, you're, he's, he's rock solid. Um, and, we're, and we're hunting some of those, those canyons and guys are coming in, coming in. And, you know, it's like one guy we grab and one guy doesn't quite give up and he starts to, you know, pull on that gun or the knife. Phoebe gets that bite. Um, he doesn't make too much noise too quick. We get her off the bite and we just kind of go silent, just like we're still hunting and you just wait and just listen and go, okay, we made a little noise. That sounded a little dramatic, but it was only, it might've been 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. It was a short engagement and knowing the wind was in our face early morning, we're going uphill. So, Hey, this is good. Let's keep hunting. So we just keep moving up. Then we see a couple other processors and they got guns and it's a, it's a quiet announcement. It's good for our safety as well. And without going too much into all of the particulars, she goes and she gets a second deployment. He doesn't give up. She gets her second bite and we got him. Yeah. Um, she never had more than d a double. Yeah. And then fast forward, we go down her back to my old stomping grounds of Riverside County. And this actually happened right after I retired. And I was talking to the guys, great story. I was hearing from them on this and um, Phoebe's retired, you know, she's sick and we're, we haven't lost her yet, but Brian's down with Champ, and we got our other dog down there, you know, and Nick's dog, and we're doing our thing, and all of a sudden, I start getting the calls from both handlers as soon as they have cell coverage. They're in the middle of nowhere, eight miles deep in the canyon, and it's funny because the calls and texts started coming in like seconds apart, and they were just trying to get coverage so they can tell the story, <laughs> and Nick's like, I got a triple. No shit. I got a triple. Brian never got a triple. <laughs> you know? And then Brian's like, Ah, oh, Nick got a triple, but got a triple. You know, it was just one of those things where I went, oh, guys, I just didn't have anything to see that. But then, you know, get the phone call, do the debrief. And you know, that was one where it was just armed guys everywhere. Yeah. So, like, you know, Brian's dog got two that day. You know, Buck got a couple, three. And it's just because they were hunting very meticulously and carefully. And, yeah. and Mike, it's the thing. If we have the time and we can be patient, we could spend seven-tenths of the of the 15-hour, 20-hour day of that window yeah. just hunting with canines. Yeah. And it's a fine line operationally, like how long do I keep my guys out there on the hunt when I know we still got 10,000 plants to eradicate and that's physical, Yeah, you know, and they're probably half contaminated, so we're going to be wearing nitrile stuff, protective equipment. It's 100 degrees. We're going to take three, four hours to do that, and then we're going to try to reclimate that or at least stabilize it for reclamation later. Yeah. It's a fine line. And yeah. sometimes I've I've had to pull back and just call the hunt yeah and there could be more guys but we've got the area secured and we you know yeah. our dogs are good enough like the dogs you work with 
we could track those guys five miles away and probably yeah. catch them if we put another two days into it. Yeah. But there's kind of a point of no return. Sure. And um and you know Brian's a brother and you know he would always go I, just just a little farther, John, and I get yeah. Brian. We're at the point of no return. <laughs> yeah. I mean we're we're getting to the point where yeah. you, your dog, and I'm losing comms with you. You're yeah. getting out there and. That's, your support we're, we're too yeah. spread out there's, there's a parallel to being at vegas that fits that like right it's just one more fucking bet one more bet man yeah. i'm just gonna spin yeah. spin it one more time yeah, yeah. the uh I, I, yeah i mean we, again we could talk about the dog stories all day one thing that i, I did think of just in, in hearing you talk about you know the pain in the ass that the reclamation is i wonder you know may, maybe something to bring up the flagpole i don't know maybe it's uh, rolling the dice too big but you know the same way that they have correction facilities people picking up fucking trash right. on the side of the road but obviously you'd have to shake them shake them down hard before they come back Absolutely. in they're, they're gonna have yeah. weed shoved up their ass and <laughs> fucking hidden in their gums and up their nose and in their ears and fucking wherever but uh, right. but you know put the put them to fucking work you know put yeah like whatever jurisdiction you know whatever the nearest correction facility is you know outsource a hey here's your list of fucking shit go go clean this up you know, that, know. that's a great idea and it would be the most relevant effective way for community service yeah. to work off and it would work and we, we even you know had the idea well hey if uh if these deportable felons aren't getting deported and they're going to be processed through our courts with some non-sanctuary state counties and you know courts would do up to a point yeah. why can't we put those growers back into cleaning up their mess yeah let's let's you know supervise them if we have the infrastructure to do it yeah i mean it's kind of kind of yeah. karma in a good way right yeah sure yeah it is um Back to canine real quick before we get into the uh, sniper. Is the, there's two things. One is there is there one bite that stands out as being just because I'm, I'm a morbid fuck. Um, is is there a nastiest bite that you, that comes to mind that was the there, most damage done that you can talk about real yeah, quick? Yeah, there, there's one, um, and it's two bites I want to talk about. One wasn't as morbid, but it was that pivotal 2012 case mm -hmm. uh, with Croy Road that I want to share, yeah. um, if you don't mind. Um, but the most pivotal one that was the most damaging. Um, was a mission we did up in that asshole alley. Mm -hmm. so it was like the first year in there. And um, we didn't have our dog that day. Brian was, even though we had our team, Brian was needed somewhere else and already committed to a mission. Uh, Nick wasn't on the team and didn't have a dog yet. And then we had the whole problem of, well, we really need a dog in this area. And the nice thing is we had our, our brothers from Santa Clara County Sheriff's and now they have a dog. Mm -hmm. And they have a really good dog. And he bites, really, he bites hard and he's a big male, big male, I'm gonna say, 80, 80 ish in, in weight. He, he's a big boy. Yeah. And he's fucking angry. <laughs> he's a little angry and he's light speed, you know, and um, he's just one of those dogs. Yeah. And um, his handler has him, uh, you know, uh, Bark does a great job with him. And we had those guys with us. And, and this was an aggressive crew. This was three processors all in camo and we're hiding behind a brush pile. They're 15 yards from us, but you can't get directly to them. We had to literally go around a big brush obstruction and, um, for the listener, these guys are so skilled that wherever they're at in the grow, they have an escape trail planned. And they've been in this terrain, right? Two, three, four, five months already. So mm -hmm. it's their backyard. It's their yeah. bedroom. It's their kitchen. We're in their world. Yeah. And trying to know how to be quiet to get to them and where they're going to the rabbit out to, they have the advantage. And these guys had a sawed-off shotgun. They had a forty-five automatic pistol and some other guns. And sure enough, one of them had the gun and was going for it. And we finally made the announcement. And... <laughs> And uh, their canine, Nos, he just, I've never seen a big dog move so fast and do a U-turn, a hairpin, <laughs> and literally flip his hips out, flying through the air to get around that brush pile. And then we just heard the screams on the other side. The gun was dropped. And when we got up there, um, their team leader was covering me with a rifle. I was back in bark, or, or bark up. And there we are with this guy, and he was arm bit. And he was a big boy. Yeah. But there was a lot of the inner arm missing, I yeah. mean, he took a big chunk of flesh, and there was a big chunk of flesh on the ground, and I just went, oh, my gosh, I'm going to have to tourniquet this guy. Yeah. And I was able to stop the bleeding. We, we did an Israeli bandage nice and tight, but he was demoralized, man. Oh, man. I mean, it was, there, was a, there was a lot of arm missing. Fuck. And, and, you know, <laughs> on us, he wasn't on that bite very long, yeah. but, you know, and, and he didn't want to give up. Yeah. We, had to, we had to do a, a heart out that day. Yeah. But uh, so the, he saved the day and saved some lives. Well, yeah, I mean, then that's the in canine. There's that disparity or that fine line of you know, 
every one of them that will actually engage will will fuck somebody up. But there's there's a, there is a different level, <laughs> right? Of where I don't give a fuck who you are or how hard you are. Like that yeah. that notion or that tactic of well, I'll give them the arm and then bring this is not going to work with some of them like that. Right. That do so much damage so fast to where it's it's just a, it's a I think it's a, a primal instinctual reaction of of um, you know self. Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Fucking self-preservation of, of that. You know, you, yeah. you're, you're not going to try to stab it. Like you're, you're going to try to minimize the amount of damage that the dog is doing. And, and those right. dogs are, are different level. But uh, and, and in that case, brother, it, we needed that level of force. Yeah. You know, and because this guy was a big guy, he was tough, and he was pulling a weapon hardcore. Yeah. And if Nas had gone any lighter on him, I still think because. It was this arm, and he had the other arm free, and the Probably handgun on the other dollar. side, and the left side. Yeah. He would have pulled, you yeah. know. So he, yeah. we needed a we needed a heavy bite that day. Yeah. Yeah. It was the right dog for yeah. sure. No, yeah. Absolutely. Um, the last uh, dog question I have, uh, or we'll spend the rest of the time talking about him, <laughs> is uh, I did notice something that was that seemed to be um, atypical in, in the canine world is that it looked like you had, you had three females, right? Phoebe, Luna, and Zoe. Is it? Yeah. Um, which to me, I was like, Christ, you, you, you rarely hear of a female, let alone right. three on one small unit. Was that just total, um, uh, coincidence or, or it, was there it something kind of was, it was, it was really getting down to, um, what dogs look the best. Yeah. And, you know, our, we, you know, our whole canine command staff and our trainers help choose those dogs. But when it comes to a dog that's, you know, going to go to the Met team, especially it's real critical that Buck and Brian are in that selection process. And Brian can, you know, like you, he's had so much experience around dogs. He knows exactly what to look for in the initials. And then gets, you know, we usually work with breeders that we can work with them for a while. And it's kind of like a warranty, if you will. Yeah. And if it's starting to work or there's signs that it's not gonna work and, you know, we're gonna give it the college try. We're not oh, gonna yeah. just take a dog from a breeder and, you know, uh, you know, we're feeling a little weird, you know, after a couple of weeks. I mean, it's gonna be a season or half a season, whatever. But the thing we kept finding is, um, Phoebe was one of those one in a million females. She just happened to be the perfect balance. And that was largely like we talked about the relationship with Brian. Zoe happened to be a very small dog, yeah. but she had all the traits. And like when you talk about canine warriors of having all five of those traits balanced that you hardly ever see, yeah. Zoe for a little micro missile had all those traits. Yeah. And Buck didn't only see it, but Brian saw it. And when the two of them you know, looked at that dog together and said, you know what? She's small, but she's actually ideally suited for this environment. Yeah. She'll be super fast. She'll be hard to stab. Um, and she was biting pretty darn hard for yeah. her size. So she just, by design, we didn't look at really gender. Yeah. She just happened to work out great. Yeah. And then the craziest thing about that, like I put in the book, is she's having a, a I mean, like an Olympic gold medal career her first season. Yeah. She's, she's approaching 30 bites in a season working side by side with Phoebe, working her own missions, they're together, they're apart, we're spread out. I mean, because we had gone through all the trial and error that Phoebe went through, so we were ready. Yeah. And when this dog comes in, and this dog just was, a, you know, she had, the, she had that, that heart to be with the team, she loved the team, you know, she was a energy drive, the, the, her prey drive especially was high for a female, it was just crazy. Um, and she went to work out of the gate and just immediately, immediately, because again, another great handler combination with Buck yeah. and her. Fucking 30 bites. Yeah, that's crazy. What, for the listener, what is the season span? Our season starts as early as late April on a real dry year. On a wet year, it starts in May. And we're going to be going till about late October, yeah. give or take. And we're doing, you know, we're doing a mission a week. Uh, 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 we're doing a mission a day somewhere in the state every week. And yeah. we're working weekends, too, because yeah. we mix it up so nobody can predict when we're going to come. Um, so there's a lot of missions, but you know, a dog's doing no more than one mission a day. And if it's been a couple of days of real hot weather and she's, both those dogs have deployed several times or they've done long hikes, we get to a point where they're going to need a half a day of rest. Yeah. They're going to need to hydrate. You know, they might have an injury. They might yeah. have got concussed, which, you know, it may be informally, but, and our handlers are good buffers at that. Yeah. Um, but Zoe was on her way to doing exactly what Phoebe was doing in her career even quicker because a learning curve was eliminated by two or three years. And then all of a sudden she's sick yeah. and we get this leukemia thing diagnosed and she comes straight from Belgium, checked out through a good breeder. She had no signs of any issues and we get into the poisons. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. You that's for, for the listener. That's a, a huge 
environmental hazard for right. for the dogs with you guys you know you got clothes on gloves you're also self-aware right that hey that these things are covered well they, they're fucking oblivious to it so they're running through you know getting the shit on them is there obviously that's a huge component i mean are you guys bathing the dogs at, yeah. right afterwards and yeah or, you know yeah, you know to that point mike it, it got really really things got really western on the poison tox toxicology front with these van poisons two years ago when some federal officers, not even in California, were exposed to it, um, the carbofuran on another marijuana situation back on the east somewhere. And I mean, almost fatally, these guys were really sick. And federal OSHA came down on Forest Service, national parks and said, wait a minute, no more going into grows till we sort this out. You know, PP, all the protection protocol, um, decon on site, a uniform a day, you're not wearing the same camos, you gotta wear boots, you know, that are slick, that you can decon with the right wipes. And we were doing all that protocol, and we followed suit from the state level, we kept doing missions, but there was no canine PPE protocol really being developed officially. Yeah. But we started to see it, and it was that. It was it was washing them down, it was get them out, getting them out of the grow environment as quick as possible, especially on a grow we considered contaminated. We do a site assessment every mission we go on. And, and if we see, kind of, it looks like white bird poop or splotches and it's actually in a white form and it hasn't dried to be invisible when it's, and that's about a 14 day window when this stuff is at its maximum toxicity. We won't even touch the plants, yeah. even with protection gear. We won't eradicate it, we won't contaminate nets. You know, it's one of those things where we're gonna have to give it some time. We'll watch the grow so someone doesn't come in and rip it, but what we won't do is risk us or the dogs. Yeah. But if we see this stuff all over a grow site, we keep the dogs out of that area, we keep them in a clean water source, good soil. Um, even then, we're looking at some sort of nitrile paw protector where they can still have traction, and that's a new science, but getting some sort for that absorption problem yeah. through their paws, you know, um, and making sure they, they never drink water in a grow, even if it looks like a pristine check dam or it's coming right out of the creek. It's always out of Camelbacks, extra water bottles, yeah. because, you know, these guys put the crap right in the water source. Yeah. They're not like dumping it on each plant. So yeah. um, we can't prove it. We can't prove that Zoe was poisoned, but... Given our experience, there's a high likelihood that was the problem. Yeah. And, and for a dog like that to suddenly just out of the blue, yeah, it's it, it, it made no sense, yeah. man. No, I mean, it's, she was she barely two. Yeah, the, the causation, I, I think, is, is pretty, pretty much there. But um, with having three female canines, I, I know my thoughts on it, and I, but I know the listener is going to want me to ask, uh, did you guys spay them? Uh, or and if you didn't, uh, did their heat cycles impact their workability at all? Did that play any any factor or role in their operational? Capacity? Yeah, it didn't, and uh, and they were they were spay. Yeah, yeah. Early on, it was one of those things where after that happened to Phoebe, and everybody saw what Phoebe developed into trainers, operators, canine. But they're like, oh man, we would really like to have some pups with Phoebe and another good male. But yeah. it was one of those things that just didn't want to risk that. You know, any type of you know, distractions, any type of problems. And if a heat cycle happened to happen in the middle of operational season and there were working with a lot of male dogs, yeah. it was it would have just been a mess. So yeah. that, that's what our canine guys and, and yeah. actually our canine coordinators elected to do. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. So moving into uh, sniper stuff, just because it's obviously an integral part. If you can talk to uh, firing up the, the sniper team, uh, if you will, uh, do you want to take a, a quick break? Oh, not at all. Not at all. I was just looking at a note, but yeah, go ahead. Uh, so with, with the sniper team, uh, the integration, that, you know, was there a specific mission that kicked off or, or was kind of the, uh, the light switch of realizing, holy shit, we need sniper integration? And if so, what, what was that and how did it get born into the program? You know, that's a, that's a great question, Mike. And there were two reasons um, we felt a sniper program was going to be really beneficial in MET. But not only for MET, but to help all of our divisions, you know, in, in, in the wildlife branch um, and also other agencies. First and foremost, we had been on so many grow sites and, you know, a lot of them are too dense where an overwatch is really going to work. But you get a percentage of grows that are really big um, that you can kind of be a bird's eye view and you can see everything going on. You can get, you know, um, patterns on the growers, what they do, how they move, what time they move, where they operate, what they wear, what guns they're pushing, all of that. And when I can put, you know, a pair of our, our Delta team snipers up with good optics and capable of reaching out, they can watch all morning, all night, and then cover that entry team coming in. And something we made, because we're a small team, is we made a small, lightweight, intermediate to long-range platform that was hikeable. So 
as soon as we're done on Overwatch as a sniper element, we're not just packing it up and going and waiting in you know, the IC. We're going to integrate back in yeah. and be mobile to jump into something else. It was kind of a, you know, taking a little bit of stuff that we were seeing from SEAL team snipers being very mobile in the war on terror overseas and you know, taking equipment, and, and a lot of it had to do with good ballistic and, and you know, weapon technology that you could get you know, the right system to hit accurately to the ranges you would need, and optics that don't make the gun too heavy, but they give you great observation potential where you're not gonna shoot, which most of the time we don't, obviously. So yeah. um, they helped a lot. Uh, we were able to get a sniper team going about five months into 2014 when Met was officially full-time. And I also had the very hand, small handful of guys that were already sniper trained. Obviously, Frog, that was nine years a SEAL team sniper and taught s sniping, you know, what a godsend, right? Yeah. So bringing him in, I had some experience. I was already teaching it all over the place and, you know, had sniper systems and a lot of history there. Marcos was, was a certified sniper. I had another operator there, Shang, that's in the book. Um, he had already years ago come over to some of our Santa Clara County basic schools. Um, he was a very good rifleman. And then we got a younger, um, we got Mac, who is a younger sniper and came on later, my number five but a, a guy that was just a great shot, in great shape, motivated, and we rounded it out very nicely with guys that had the experience. Um, and it just, it was good integrated training where it was seamless, hmm. you know? Um, we get together multiple times throughout the month as a unit to train tactically, whether it's canines, crows, defensive tactics, snipers, and then we integrate sniper training with canines and with, with entry team training all the time yeah. because the team works so tightly together. So from a Met standpoint, that's where they were really good, and then, surveillance operations for doing doing overwatch for our patrol guys or our other divisions rather commercial wildlife doing some high risk entry on a warrant where you know the threat matrix on the guys we're going after because they're maybe selling or poaching abalone and selling the stuff on the black market but they've got an extensive violent criminal history kind of nice to be able to watch those guys early on you know and give a little yeah. eye in the sky that can that can that can uh, keep our guys safe so yeah. after we were formed you know we were we were doing four or five deployments a, a season we were training all the time. We were working with other agencies and, you know, still going strong. So it, it was a nice added force multiplier and a little more officer safety enhancement to have that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to me, I, I think that just like with, you know, the natural aversion or, or kind of the thought process of what the fuck are you guys doing here? I think a lot of people would be like, why does game warden need snipers? Oh, but, was, yeah. but you know, the, the tactical side of, of my experience, like, yeah, it's a fucking no brainer for, for what yeah. you guys are doing to have uh, one or two guys at different vantage points that are, you know, elevated that they can see shit and, and if need be take a shot. Ha has there been any real world sniper shops in your uh, sniper shots in your unit? Um, we have had, to, we haven't had to shoot two legged, bad guys oh, I got you. but we've had to shoot some four-legged no shit we've had to take out some some problem public safety animals yeah. that um without going into too much detail because some of it's pretty quiet and I, sure. I didn't really go into it in the book but yeah. um you know problem predators that were you know re threatening some some real sensitive species and threatening people actually yeah and it it had to be sharpshooters that could you know hike at really high elevation and get behind the right people tracking the animals yeah um to, to do it quick and clean. Yeah. And, and so we did that. Yeah. 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 That was one of, that was a, and, and something I didn't foresee coming. Yeah. You know, again, another out of the box, you know, yeah. game warden deployment because we do so many different things. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. Uh, one thing that I thought was neat, uh, and again, I, you see it uh, even with some of our guys in terms of, of being a little extra sneaky, but if you could talk about some of the, uh, unconventional and uh, obscure methods that some of these cartel <laughs> guys are using to cover their tracks. Some of the different oh man, uh, yeah, I know you're, you're referring to some of those pictures and stories yeah. uh, in Hidden War, but y you know, I show a PowerPoint when I teach to this to other agencies and you know different groups, and even guys that work this are just blown away by some of the stuff we find on trail camera yeah. or what we find in you know some of these growers' backpacks and. When you see guys showing up on trail cameras with, you know, 100 pound sea bags full of grow supplies, maybe they got a, you know, long rifle shouldered with the, with the sea bag, they got a big spool of black poly pipe and a shovel sticking out. Well, 
clues tell you pretty yeah. pretty good chance they're a grower, right? Yeah. But on the bottom of their feet are like these big white felt slippers, and they're all tied off, and they're yeah. going across a gravel road, leaving no tracks. Yeah. And I and I, I have a photo that actually shows that from a 2015 case right in Santa Clara County, and my, you know my home is Silicon Valley. And had we not seen those bad guys on camera, we would have never attracted them until somebody yeah. turned the grow in way late in the season. But they're so good at masking their tracks because they know we're looking at them on the ground. Um, they're even doing stuff to try to keep their scent down because they know dogs can track. Um, we even saw something as crazy as wooden carved cattle hooves that with leather straps that they would put on the bottom of their feet and mass themselves as cattle. Yeah. And you know, Forest Service and our national forests have cattle leases. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're seeing an inordinate amount of cattle in areas and we're getting tips on grows from hunters and hikers. And I think it was in this canyon or maybe we see something from the air or someone smells it. And you know we're we're going to look every avenue. We're not just going to drop in on that grow out of a helicopter and be a couple guys on a short haul line, be in that pinata to get batted out of the sky. We're going to go in on the ground and find them the hard way and do it safely. So we would you know mile after mile trying to find this trail, and all we're seeing are cattle tracks. Cattle Fucking tracks. Fucking cows are getting high again. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> what are cows? This it's just cows. The stakes have never been higher, right? Right. No pun intended. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, brother, uh, that's what they were doing. They were integrating with the cattle, and then they were getting way into the deep into the woods, taking the tracks off. Now they're in an area where no one's looking. They're by a water hole, and then we found some of those in some in some bad guys' backpacks we caught. And I'm yeah. like, clever bastards. Yeah, it's a fucking trip, no doubt. It's I mean, a trip, man. Yeah. And and like, how about the punji pit pictures? Oh, I know. It's like some shit straight out of Rambo or you know it's Vietnam crazy. movies. But, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, they're they're. I mean, we laugh about it, but it's some dangerous shit, and they're dedicated and and uh, you know disciplined to their fucking cause. Uh, going just one thing I forgot to ask about uh, from the sniper standpoint, and just armament in general. I know we talked a little bit about it uh, at the beginning of the interview, but um, you reference uh, POF Patriot Ordnance Factory, which yeah. I, I have one of their uh, their five five six rifles. But nice. Uh, I'm curious, is that kind of your go-to brand that you guys were using for both sniper and normal day to day? And was it always the 308, or were you guys rocking different? Uh, caliber. Yeah, yeah, good questions there. It is now our standard brand because we, uh, up until, oh, I want to say mid-2000s, we did not have a, a formalized standard patrol rifle for the entire agency. Um, we had a rifle program, you provided your own, and we'd have everything from 30-30 lever actions to bolt actions to some guys' AR-15s if you know they were AR guys or veterans from the Vietnam conflict, because there are a lot of veterans from all the forces on our, uh, you know, in our force. Um, and we needed to, we needed to kind of change that. We needed to s solidify that. And we had an opportunity to get military M14s in great shape through the DRMO program on loan to us when we didn't have a lot of money as an agency. So we got 144 true M14s valued at about 30,000 each. These were Jesus. full auto with the auto, you know, with basically the auto selector removed, yeah. but mill spec beautifully made by the four manufacturers. Um, they were big. They were hefty, but they were bulletproof. Yeah. They shot great. So we used that. We supplemented the rest of the agency because we were at about 350 officers at the time with M1A scouts. Um, the M14 with the 22-inch barrel was cumbersome, but I had I had a uh, a Winchester M14 made by the Winchester company that was just amazing. But it was it was a it was a big piece of equipment. Um, we were cutting down barrels, you know, making them into just like you guys did on the teams when you ran the M14s early earlier. Um, we were making them as short and as portable as possible, putting red dots on them, scout sights, you know, Veltor collapsing stocks, but they were still a little big for the brush. We wanted to stay with 308 because of ballistics, penetration in Manzanita, dirt in that type of country. Um, and then we tested weapons to replace that with something more efficient, lighter, more functional, more agronomic. And have, we, we decided on an AR platform and we tested like 20 weapons. Um, and I was on the firearms committee, kind of co-seeing this whole test. And, you know, we tested, I mean, we tested SIG, we tested FN, we tested POF, we tasted Bravo Company, we did 556 direct impingement, we did piston drivers. We had like 20 guns out there in, in various calibers. Um, 300 blackout wasn't happening quite yet, unfortunately. And, you know, a lot of us like the lighter weight 556s for the brush work, but in ballistic tests, the overall vote was, let's stay with the heavy caliber, just suck it up. It's not gonna be pleasant every day, but at least we know we're gonna have this caliber. And from our patrol guys, we weren't just developing a, a really, you know, 
progressive weapon system for special operations because we didn't have a formalized MET team yet, but the marijuana fights we were having catalyzed doing this for the whole agency. So this, pro, this rifle was going to be for everybody, which doesn't normally happen in even a, a, you know, any other police force. So everybody was going to get a red dot, a tactical light. They were going to have this thing colored, you know, OD green and, and tan. Um, it was going to be, you know, multiple magazines. They were going to have a true do everything gun, whether you had to shoot a, you know, public safety mountain lion or bear with the big caliber, you had to, you know, be a perimeter on a bank robbery, or you dealt with an active shooter as a game warden first, and you, you jump into that diamond stack, or you're on a MET mission. Yeah. So we tested everything, and um, the only three companies that um, ended up putting in a bid at our specs were SIG with their 716, but it wasn't quite finalized yet. POF and FN for their SCAR Heavy. The HK didn't with their 416 and 417? H, we, we really, I was really a big fan of the 416 and Larry yeah. Vickers had come out and we, I trained with Larry and we had done stuff together and he was actually working for HK and he brought the 416 out to my Santa Clara buddies, all those guys we talked about in the early days and I wanted a 416, 417, but they wouldn't build it the way we wanted. We needed it with a shorter barrel. Yeah. We needed it colored right. We yeah. needed an optic, and HK was such a big powerhouse. We were we were going to order 400 guns. Yeah, it's too small a fish. And it was it was a little too small. Yeah. Um, so we looked at the Sig, we looked at the POF, um, and then we went ahead and uh, and the Scar Heavy was was the third in price, and it was based on price point GSA. You know, we we go with the lowest bid. All three were good companies. Um, Sig's technology wasn't quite there yet, but they really really being progressive, and I love Sig platforms on on every level. Um, but they didn't pass the test. We had a 6,000 round torture test, which is mimicking the 5.56 M4 test that all the military branches use, but there's no real torture test for the higher pressures of a 308. Yeah. We said, hey, if a, t if a 308 AR platform can hold up to what the, f the M4 does and actually make it, it's probably gonna be a pretty good platform. So um, Sigwa came in slightly under cost of uh, POF. POF was under SCAR. For the FN, so we just went in order, and when when unfortunately the Sig 716 didn't pass, we tested Frank's piston-driven P308, the the bigger version, that what we call the heavy gun now, because they have the new revolution, and um, and it ran on rails. It was a sewing machine. We did 6,000 rounds, and you know cleaned it every five, heated it up, um, you know we had uh, there's wear items like extractors and a 762 that go quick. Um, the extractor kind of broke at like 2,600 rounds. Um, it's only supposed to go about 1,200, 1,500 at the time. Um, we were fine with it. It didn't fail. It was a replaceable part. That was a lot of punishment. Um, Frank, the owner of POF, was kind of pissed off watching the test. He goes, I can engineer that better. So he built a bigger extractor <laughs> so it could go for 10,000 or whatever it did. Yeah. But it held up. Um, and then we ran those guns for, for years and um, a lot more ergonomic, you know? Um, I had been pushing to have some sort of red dot and some sort of light system, like my sheriff's partners had in 05 when we had the shooting. Mm. I mean, I was trying to find my target in dim light, at first light, through brush, with all this movement, through a peephole standard iron sight mm. and a front blade on an on a 18 inch barreled M14. And obviously working off a dot and training on a dot with all these other weapons, it was, it was an extreme disadvantage that day. And I said, if nothing else, let's get dots. But again, we weren't in the mindset as an agency to have special weapons for special guys. Yeah. But when the POF thing came on board, we said, well, everybody's special. Let's make this a patrol rifle that, S that special ops can use. Um, and that's what we've been running. And then yeah. just last year, we went to the new revolution and they made a nice 14 and a half inch barrel version from their 16 inch version. So it's, the, it's an M4 size platform on an M4 frame holds up well with the 762 and yeah. the whole thing weighs right at seven pounds. Yeah. So that's what we're running now. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a damn good rifle, no doubt about it. I know I was a big fan of their PDW shorter, you know, the S, cool, SPR yeah. thing is pretty badass. But like I said, with the with the Rattler for me, that's like the perfect mix yeah. of, of everything really. Um, because with a with a lighter grain, 110, 120 uh, grain bullet, you can absolutely go as far as you need to with it. Yeah, you know, it's got crazy drop on it, but just accommodate for it the same way you would anything else, you know. Man, brother, you but, hit it on the head with that platform. And now that I have one and I'm shooting that in Montana, I jokingly, like I said, I tell my buddies back home and they're like, you know what, B sucker. Why, yeah. no, why, <laughs> why, we just can't have that in Cali, right, no, with that no. short barrel restriction, all that. Yeah. But it, it is such a good platform. Yeah. And, you know, and that's really what 
teams like this that can do that in other states need to look at. And yeah. I was just at that national conference talking to game wardens all over the state that are now having this problem, and, and they're looking at forming teams. Yeah. And they're in states where they could run that rattler. Yeah. And they, yeah. And they just might. Yeah. No, you know? That's good. That's so, good. That's good shit. Um, all right. So moving forward towards the end of the book and, and getting into some of the kind of political challenges that that you face, you talk about, uh, you know, with the sanctuary and, and ice restrictions that some of these yeah. assholes have implemented that uh, makes your job way, way more dangerous and, uh, and much harder. Um, if you could talk to the, the frustrations that you've had specifically in the state of California with, uh, with some of that stuff. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is, you know, everybody understanding that, you know, we, we, we didn't put Hidden War out to be an anti-immigration message or to be you know, a, a build a wall message or any of that. I mean, the reader's gonna, you know, derive what they're gonna derive from it. And something we learned um, to, to answer the question kind of multidimensionally, like in one of the chapters, I go into debriefing some of these upper level grow bosses and them telling us, <laughs> your border's nothing. Yeah. You know, they're laughing. They're yeah. like, you deport one of my tier one growers that I want back up there to make money, it's gonna cost me four to $7,000. He'll be back in a day. He's gonna go do his thing. So that's just a speed bump on you know Texas Highway 472. It's yeah. not even really anything. So we know that to be a fact of how that's perceived from the bad guy's side. Um, but in California, we are a sanctuary state and there's other states now that are. And something we experienced firsthand was, you know, when you're told by your upper echelon that you can't talk to ICE, you can't talk to Homeland Security or your federal brothers and sisters, and by policy we're, we're mandated to because we are federally sworn, um, that's frustrating. And I know that's politics, but it's politics that don't really add up to the fact that I don't think anybody, I would like to think anyone under the sanctuary state doctrine of making that you know, a policy, say in the state of California, were ever thinking they wanted to hide or protect deportable felons. I yeah. mean, these are not legitimate people trying to do legitimate immigration, chase the American dream. These are guys that aren't gonna be legal anywhere. Yeah. International watch lists, narcotics history, convictions, rape, you know, weapons use, and, and we gotta remember what these guys are really about and what they really lack in respect for any humanity, any health and human safety or wildlife. So um, ha being told that when we're you know, into a case with a deportable felon in a gunfight and told you can't work with the federal authorities that can do something with this from their mandate, um, that is frustrating. And it's, it's contradictory to, I think, what we, what we should be doing for national security and also the preservation of our, or the, you know, the protection of our wildlife, wild lands and waterways. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. I, I found myself uh, becoming ir irritable, not that that's hard to do, uh, <laughs> and, and frustrated uh, in reading some of the things, uh, most specifically in the punishments and how lax they were. Right. Uh, and so, I, you know, if you could, like, can you give us an example of, of a, uh, we'll say a run of the mill or an average sentencing for some of these guys you were busting? I mean, it, it most times seems like it, it panned out to be a slap on the dick, if that. A lot of times it was next to nothing. Yeah. Um, the only way we ever got real good penalties on a cannabis case, or we would even get them prosecuted, and I just thank heaven for environmental crimes, and the left and the right, the users and non-users of cannabis, everybody agrees no one wants to see poison water. No one wants to see all the wildlife you know, in America destroyed. And so we have a sympathetic jury, no matter how, you know, no how pro-cannabis somebody is, to what these guys are doing to the environment. When we bring in the banned poisons and the felonies, when we bring in the water diversions, the poached deer, you know, you're starting to get into felony s status. Yeah. You're starting to get judges and prosecutors that will give these guys several years in prison. Um, in, in our prisons though, right? Yeah, in our prisons. And a lot of times, unless you know, it's a state that's going to work with ICE and there's not a sanctuary state where ICE can handle this, they're going to get deported and hopefully handled, you know, yeah. out of state and, and not tie up our tax dollars as well as not continue to do any more damage, you know, yeah. that we have in, in, in our wildlands. But by and large, it's taken a lot of years to get decent penalties and I still feel they are too, they are too light. Well, yeah, and so here I'll pose a, a hypothetical to you. Me being a, a former seal and, and an American citizen, if I go to the state of California and I have an AK-47 fully auto right, and, and I get pulled over with that, what's going to happen to me? Yeah, exactly. I'm fucked. You're done. I mean, I'm yeah. completely fucked. You're a felon renegade, man. But, but here you've got 
people who aren't even American citizens that are right. fucking up waterways, that are poisoning wildlife, that are shooting at law enforcement officers, not citizens, with full auto fucking guns. And it's like, right. well, we'll just kick you back to your fucking country and you'll be here tomorrow. Or they give them, you know, the, the, the harshness of their penalty stems more from from polluting water than it does a, a firearm charge. Exactly. And, I, and, I, and I would just ask, how the fuck is that possible? Yeah, it, uh, it, it's baffling to us. And you know, when we go into this from the standpoint of wildlife officers and start to see this type of environmental criminal and look at all the things that are wrong with the program. Um, and you know, it, it gets down, I've always said this, I mean, take any particular personal bias out of the equation. Where do you draw the line and finally say there's a black and white line? It's just gotten so gray of, you know, one agenda that wants to promote legitimate immigration, which I completely understand. I don't have anything against that. But when you start kind of downplaying what's really going on from the standpoint of these deportable felons that kind of taint that image of that agenda, you've lost it. Yeah. You know, you, you, you've lost it for... Uh, you know, you lost it for, I think, national security for one. Mm -hmm. um, and for two, being passionate about wildlife and growing up the way I did and why I went the direction as a game warden, um, it just infuriates me. Yeah. And it's disgusting to see this impact. Now, one thing I can say is there's a, been a little more of a distinction in California with our new governor to say, okay, what are these trespass growers? How different are they? Oh, they are deportable felons. They are cartel. Okay. Well, we're not going to hide that anymore. We're going to bring the national guard. We're going to support Met. So, um, I didn't, I wasn't sure what was going to happen with the new administration. And I wasn't sure what was going to happen in, in lieu of the retirement and the next phase for Met, but they are getting the support. And there is that distinction between that deportable felon yeah. and the sanctuary state for immigration however that's that's perceived yeah well that is good to hear for sure i mean there's plenty of room to grow but uh you know that's step one i guess uh, right one thing that I, I have no doubt the listener may be thinking uh, and i know i did and you and you address it towards the end of the book before i go there just on the youtube channel uh one thing i thought was awesome big old fucking <laughs> weed weed plant foil yeah. foil embossed on the hardcover is it crazy yeah awesome. my publishers are really yeah. adamant man that like, caribou said we're, we're gonna make yeah. it vivid the, the fact that yeah, a, a former <laughs> uh, state game warden with a book with a weed leaf on it's fucking <laughs> priceless uh, at any rate um People are, are un, undoubtedly thinking, okay, well, legalizing it should fix that, right? You go to pretty great lengths um, in some of the appendices at the end of having some other other people's uh, contributions to, to part of the problem talks about that. Can you talk to legalization, the pros and the cons, and, and you know the, the little impact that at first, you would think, well, legalizing it should help with that, but it really hasn't. Can you, can you talk to that? Yeah, I absolutely can. And it, it, it's interesting, Mike, that it's funny how so many people look at an easy solution and they don't look at the bigger picture when you try to blanket solve a problem. And everyone told us when MET was forming back in 2013, we knew regulation legalization was just a couple years off, if that. Mm -hmm. And even guys within our own agency are like, so you guys are going to build this trick team and put all these resources into it. It's going to be legal in like two years at the most. You're going to be out of a job. Okay, let's dive into the issue and really see if we're going to be out of a job. I had so many people, you know, with the first book and outreach and training say the same thing. Like, oh man, well now that it's legal, man, I'm glad this has gone away. And I'm like, let me show you a picture. Let me yeah. give you a PowerPoint, give you a little story. Here's the rub with, with regulation. Um, there's a debate of if regulation can work or not to stop this. So far in every state that's regulated that I've seen, especially in California, I mean, people are trying to do it right to stop this or allegedly, but it's not working the way it's designed. And here's why. When we regulate on the legal front for recreation or medicinal, you know, you have permits you need, you're now inspected by groups, you have uh, organic standards, water use standards, all of this, just like any legitimate enterprise, costs money to get ramped up. Um, you have to pay your taxes, you have to be inspected, you have to have an amicable relationship with us and other cannabis inspecting entities, whether it be Department of Fish and Wildlife or, or others. Um, and honestly, what I can say in getting to know growers that are really environmentally supportive and trying to do it by the numbers, it's about 20% out of the 100% of growers, say in California as an example, it's a 20-80 split. Yeah. I was told early on by folks in the cannabis industry that were promoting um, getting above board, trying to do it right, 
trying to protect waterways and wildlife, being environmentally conscious. They said, you're always gonna see this whenever there's a black market to be had. You're gonna have a 20-80 split. It was the same way in prohibition with alcohol. It's the same way with running guns, methamphetamine, whatever. And sure enough, they were pretty much right. Yeah. And so my experience has been about 20% of the growers in California that are licensed and regulated now that abhor any environmental destruction while they produce their regulated, you know, sanctioned cannabis. They're out there and they're the biggest advocates environmentally, you know, true to form. And I didn't know that going into this. I didn't have that type of relationship. But that group, like I point out uh, at the end of the book, um, they embrace what we're doing. I mean, they've even termed our tactical team the Earth Warriors, which is kind of a laid back hippie yeah. type name. But Fucking you know what? Tree huggers. Tree, but, but you know what? Hey, I'll take it. Yeah. We're getting some support. You know, they're putting a little bit of money in foundations where their mouth is. They're really into the reclamation aspect of it where we're lacking funding. Um, but what has happened since we regulated, a lot of these growers have said, I don't want to be on Big Brother's radar. I'm not going to pay all those fees. I'm a small time <laughs> operator. They're going deep into the black market. They're still selling over state lines. And the other problem in how we regulate it was what I said in the beginning of one of the one of the good questions you brought up is, when we did regulate, we lessened the penalties for the trespass outdoor cartel grower. Yeah. So we actually encouraged them to continue doing what they're doing with impunity. We took less we we took the pressure off of them because now many operatives in my agency and others are tied up checking the quasi legal groups that are that are licensing. So it's less pressure on the biggest problem I feel. Yeah. And and that's where we're at. And other states are having the same problem. They're not stopping the black market and how they're regulating. Yeah. So, you know, from somebody who spent years fighting it and putting your life on the line, is there a is there a solution that you can think of? You know, I, I don't have a hundred percent solution. I've you know, I get the question all the time, well, if we regulate nationally and we break the back and we completely kill that cartel, that might help it if it's done again where we really go against the the trespass grower yeah. the cartel bad guy you know and we make sure that if this if if the public wants this regardless of what we feel on it personally you know can we break the black market back of the cartel on cannabis maybe we can maybe we can't i still think any regulation is going to take oversight and red tape and some people want the easy way out they want to just go to the black market and spend half as much money on good weed or what they think is good weed yeah. and and get by that way and then we have the other issue of well if we did break that market how are we going to break methamphetamine yeah. that these guys produce and what about fentanyl now yeah. and now they're lacing the fentanyl that the cartels are producing it's going into this weed so that's a whole nother gamut. I guess, you know, from my perspective on, uh, on meth and fentanyl and stuff like that is that you, you can at least minimize, like, I don't think either one of those should be, you should be able to go to fucking Walgreens and no, get, no, uh, right. but, <laughs> but, uh, Definitely not, yeah. but I also think, you know, footprint, environmental footprint wise, it's a fraction, you know, by comparison yeah. to the weed. So, by new. you know, to me, you know, taking it a step further of the, of the national legalization, you know, just my thoughts on it is, I think until weed is as uh, accessible as a pack of fucking Marlboros, yeah, it's you're gonna have it, you know. Yeah. It, because to me, if that that works, you know, tobacco and alcohol, I think are are consummate textbook examples of they're cheap enough and readily available right. enough, even though they're regulated, um, right. to where they, they've completely undercut any desire. You don't see, you know, I mean, yeah, there's people that make craft beer and maybe distill some moonshine right. or whatever, but um, nobody's fucking rolling, you know, tobacco that they grow on, gr exactly. grew on their fucking right. farm or whatever, you know, or, you know, so to me, that that's the only thing uh, or hope, I guess I would say that uh, that is even potentially possible of of being able to do that, which I don't see that happening for a long time, if ever. Yeah. Um, but it, one thing I, I'm curious of, uh, and this was the idea that I had earlier, in terms of as it relates to your guys, the the Met unit specifically. Um, the challenges you face both manpower-wise, uh, resource-wise, funding, et cetera, building. Um, are, are there any plans to, to bolster the unit that you have? Uh, and also, is there a, both in your opinion, do you see a benefit to and or are there any plans to have on the federal side, like a national yeah. MET-type unit? Yeah, that was super good points. And we're trying to get MET larger 
We're definitely trying to get them, get them enhanced a little bit. But we have a number of teams that aren't, you know, we're the tactical element primarily targeting these DTO groups. But we have watershed enforcement teams that are growing every year, you know, and up to seven officers. We have marijuana permitting teams. And um, just talking to uh, our chief, David, um, at this last uh, WC con or IWC conference um, I talked at last Tuesday, um, I didn't know yet that we got 26 more positions earmarked for cannabis, which oh, was fantastic. Sure. Wow. Now, they're not all, those aren't going to be guys that are doing the MET fight yeah. necessarily, but they're going to be, you know, handling more of the regulated cannabis stuff so MET doesn't have to get roped into that. So um, I don't know if MET's going to grow in numbers. We filled two vacancies recently, very recently, so we're going to be full power again since some retirements and transfers and promotions. But I'm constantly pushing for that. And it all comes down to funding. And one thing to get to your point on regulation is, there is funds that do come in from the regulation and the taxes, and supposedly this year, we're supposed to start getting a bunch of that money back since we did regulate two years ago that's going directly into funding these positions, manpower, overtime costs, equipment, which should help us. Yeah. It should help us grow. And on the federal front, um, I know, as, as a case in point, U.S. Forest Service are doing this very specialized with us, especially on the West Coast, but they're not just like game wardens, you know, in, in the Midwest and Central America, and then going over to um, the Eastern Seaboard, they're just starting to see this on some of their wildlife areas in their states, and they're not really equipped to handle that. And I just saw that at this last conference I talked to. So our thing is, hey, we're going to provide everything we can to help. We're going to show you all the building blocks, the you know, the failures, the trip ups we made getting there, and try to you know streamline the way they can they can solve the problem and do it on a national front where we're all sharing information and we're doing the same type of stuff at the federal level and the state level. Yeah, I, I have an idea. Throw uh, it out. Nobody's I asking, but fuck everybody. <laughs> it's my show, right? Uh, so here, here's my take is that agreed, like I think you could take the playbook that, that Met has developed and you already have the recipe for success in terms of how, do you, how you build that unit, right? tactics, protocols, all that kind of shit. Uh, I think at a federal level, what, uh, what would be a, a really neat project or program uh, is to develop a, a national federal uh, unit that, that responds all over the country. Be awesome um, to see that, yeah. And, and have a schoolhouse built in, in the first question most people are, ha are going to have is funding and building. One thing I can say in reading this book and, and knowing, you know, all the assholes that I hang out with that uh, used to do what I do for a living is that you would, you would have a, an overabundance of people like me that would volunteer to do that shit. Now, to me, where, where you can close that funding gap uh, is do a, a um, mutual agreement where it's considered a, a, res a federal reservist Nice. Uh, yeah. Where, you know, what, what guys like me and, and there, I mean, you'd have Rangers, Green Berets, CAG guys, Dev Group guys, SEALs, fucking pararescue guys for, you know, yeah. high speed uh, medics for, for the units. I mean, you'd have more than enough, yeah. more than, than there were positions available. But to me, the way that you, you leverage not having to pay these guys, um, you know, 60, 80, a hundred thousand dollar salaries times right. several hundred of them and figuring out where all these tens of millions of dollars in, in funding is going to come from is you do the reserve thing. So the guys have just like a reserve unit would is that they, they're only doing it, you know, a couple weekends yeah. here and there or whatever. You have a national training center where everybody's on the same page and they get, um, they get trained, but one, they get to do shit that they are passionate about that helps their country that still gives them a feeling of, of service camaraderie, yeah. giving back, et cetera. And, and what guys get out of it on top of that is that federal credential also, which yeah. let's be honest, every asshole in my shoes wants to have a, a federal credential to, to be able to carry a gun everywhere, which I don't think a is a bad idea and b uh, much to ask given what, what they would be giving in the process. Not but at I, all. It's a good double win. Yeah. I mean, know? to me, like you've got all these guys who are motivated that have already been selected that are already the yeah. right, right kind of guys for that, that I guarantee you, you'd have thousands of them that would want to do it that from a scheduling standpoint to just get, uh, have it where, you know, no different than, uh, you know, tier one assets where they're on call is that, you know, whether it's an on call window or yep. a drilling window or whatever is that, you know, you know that, Hey, these weekends out of the year or whatever, I'm either going to go deployable. do shit for real or, or whatever. Yep. That's, that's cool. Yeah. I mean, to me, you, you could, you could develop one hell of a, a national asset that could respond to a lot of shit. 
uh, all be on the same sheet and and not have to come so far out of pocket, right? Uh, funding and resource wise to uh, uh, to be able to to man that to where I think uh, it's it's potentially doable. So. Uh, if you can go ahead and take care of that, get that done for yeah, us. Yeah, I'll just whip that up. Yeah. That, that's phase two. Just talk, run yeah. it up the flagpole, talk to the president. <laughs> no, but to that point, Mike, it's a great idea. And what, what I found, um, especially after Wild Justice dropped, and a lot of Special Forces guys saw some of that marijuana work we were doing, you know, and they're like, oh, wow. Yeah. I, I could be a game warden and do that. Fuck yeah. You know, I would love to. I love wildlife. I love yeah. my country. And this is a domestic fight. Yeah. I'm all over this. Yeah, this yeah. is eco-terrorism. And I just yeah. fought the war on terror. And so that's the thing. But but the federal credential is huge. And absolutely, that yeah. would be a win-win. Um, and, you know, we're even getting some, you know, SEAL veterans going into reserve programs like in California yeah. just to fight that fight. But it would be so much more structured and so much more beneficial for the whole country if we did that. And something... <laughs> It's it's interesting you mentioned that solution because the whole thing with me in retirement of phase two, like I keep telling at these talks, is guys, I can speak freely now. I'm not just limited to California, and we are a country. We're yeah. not a state. Yeah. And these environmental hits are everywhere. These cartels are in every state. So let's look at it as a nationwide problem. And the game yeah. wardens are for it. Yeah. You know, and SF veterans like yourself are. It would well, be a win-win. Yeah. I mean, the neat thing, you know, in terms of Department of Interior, uh, within the scope of. Uh, National Wildlife Service Fish and Game is Zinke, a former team guy, yeah. heads that up like Montana now guy. of all fucking time. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, to, have, like a, him. Yeah, to, have, to have a <laughs> unit like that, uh, you know, in that department, I think just makes fucking sense, you yeah. know. But. And half the battle, brother, is getting the word out to show how extreme this is. I mean, one of the reasons we titled the book Hidden War, and my publisher, my lead publisher and I, Jim Schlender, and I talked about this. What are we going to title this book? And he goes... What do you think? And I said, well, what do you think of Hidden War? I said, the first book came out in 2010. We've done TV on it. We've done investigative news. We're kind of semi-high profile on it for game wardens. And yet I'm at NRA Annual launching this book with Oliver Norris endorsement. And everyone buying the book are like, oh my gosh, John, I had no idea yeah. this is going on in America. And so just the fact that it's a message that I can't push heavy enough. And thank you so much for teaming up with oh, me yeah. and, and helping push it. I think if we get this message out enough and people really see the impacts and they're not going away, yeah. you could possibly see something like that. And Zinc would be a great guy yeah. to facilitate uh, that for us. Yeah, no, What I a mean, great thing to team up on. Yeah, I mean, other, yeah, Hidden hidden War is, is about as apt as it gets, other than maybe the stakes have never been higher. Stakes yeah, I like that too. That would but, be a good title. Uh, but yeah. uh, no, it, it's, a, it's a fantastic read. Um, I found myself, uh, you know, feeling like I'm there in the moment and, and honestly just being like, fuck, I would love to do that. <laughs> I love that. Uh, I'm really glad you enjoyed yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, it was a great book. Um, it's available on Amazon, uh, Hidden War by Lieutenant John Norris, Norris, N-O-R-E-S, uh, junior, retired. Uh, Google it, buy it. Uh, it is a, a fantastic read and one that everybody honestly should uh, should understand that uh, that is going on. Um, yeah, I Mike, I, I appreciate that. And we, we have it on Kindle, and we're also going to be reading for the audiobook version of this. Because oh, a lot of operators and a lot of environmentalists and just a lot of you know readers now, we find that want to listen to this thing as they drive you know yeah. all over the states. Yeah. So we're going to do that too. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, for you know having you come speak or teach or, or anything like that, where can people find you to, to get more information? Yeah, just find me through my website. I'm at johnnorris.com, J-O-H-N-N-O-R-E-S. And uh, my email is trailblazer413, all one word, trailblazer413 at Yahoo. Um, I still, I, I don't advertise the teaching I do because it's kind of select, but yeah. reach out to me directly. I, I do a lot of speaking on the topic, as you can imagine. And I still do tactical training. I'm still in that game yeah. on, on every level for the right yeah. groups. Yeah. Oh, it's awesome. Uh, anything uh, you would like to add? I, I think if you got room, we got one more Phoebe story yeah, fuck that, yeah. that I kind of forgot about. Absolutely. Did, did forget, but we were, we were so fired up on that. But we mentioned the Croy Road mission, yeah. right? 2012 brought Brian down. This was the mission that the phone call from the Grow to Chief Mike Carrion and Nancy back to back kind of got us on the mode to have the team, right? That was really the pivotal point. They had seen enough drama. But when Phoebe came down, and without spoiling the whole chapter, um, she basically had to bite an arm grower while Brian, her handler, was dealing with that grower's partner who had a big old heavy caliber Taurus Judge pistol on his, uh, his waist and was pulling it. So Brian had to take that guy hand to hand because we were in the lead doing a canine deployment. And it was one of those moments where he just said, John, take my dog. 
Now, fortunately, we've all been trained yeah. on how to deal with Phoebe, but I'm not a handler. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm luckily like, she's the right dog. Luckily, too, she's the right some dog. Some of them would have turned right the fuck around on yeah. you and you'd have been wearing them. Yeah, I would have been wearing them yeah. and I would have been no bite sleeve that day, buddy. Yeah. So um, I'm dealing with this guy that she's got bit. And she's got him on the calf and she's got bite to rest going. And um, he was one of those tough ones that wasn't screaming like they normally do. And, you know, she was sunken down. We had blood. She was deep into tissue. She was getting a good full active, uh, you know, good angle. But he was struggling on the bottom and I'm running up on him. And when I make the dive to start jumping on this guy to get his hands where I can see him, he's starting to make that pivot. And that's when that Russian Torkarov automatic pistol drops out. He was pulling it from his waistband. Man. And had we not had the bite to rest of that amazing fur missile, that gun's right on me. We're in a gunfire exchange, handgun to handgun. And I had two riflemen behind me. So of all the times I had worked with Phoebe that we hadn't caught anybody, that was the first of about 40 times she saved my life and the rest oh, of the teams. Yeah. And there was that pucker factor going, and we all debriefed it, and we had him bandaged up, sitting in the grow a little bit later. And then we had, uh, you know, we're eradicating, and Phoebe's tethered, you know, over by a little processing area. And, and Brian's a workhorse. His dog's done for the day. She's in a non-contaminated area. She's got lots of water. You know, she can get pissy if she doesn't get her bite. She's got that kind of attitude, yeah. but tongue's out, you know, that happy dog. And uh, Brian's off doing his thing, doing a little, uh, little cleanup and evidence collection. And I got two Santa Clara County operators at you know, with M4s covering our suspects, all handcuffed right there on the ground. And I go up the hill about 40 yards, and I'm on the phone to my chiefs telling them what just happened. Man, it went well, it was close call, but we're all okay, this is a big one. And all of a sudden I hear, LT, LT, Boyd, Boyd, get down here. And Phoebe had slipped off her tether, <laughs> and she, <laughs> Oh, Brother, awesome. she crawls up next to the suspect and he's handcuffed. <laughs> he's bandaged on the calf and he's sitting there and Phoebe goes right up like hot breath in the ear. Oh, it's fucking And great. she just looks at his arm and his arm's like this and she put her mouth on his arm but didn't bite. No, she yeah. just rolled her mouth softly <laughs> and I just heard, no mas pato, no mas pato, no mas pato. He was terrified of the dog and speaking in Spanish. Oh, no more dog, Christ. no more dog. And of course, Brian runs up. Meathead, what are you doing? She didn't bite, but she went up, Got soft rolled him, his forearm. and looked him right in the eye like, yeah. I own you. Don't try to hurt my people anymore. That's the kind of dog she was, brother. Oh, that's fucking and so, great. My, she was amazing. And um, yeah, we, we joke about that. And Brian felt really embarrassed. I said, hey, that's the most controlled dog I've ever seen. Yeah. Like, oh, I, know I already bit you for pulling a gun on my peeps. Yeah. And now you're standing here around my peeps. Yeah. So yeah. I still own you. And then, she, you know, she did that. I know I, know I shouldn't have got off my lead. She called back. <laughs> but it was, it was a beautiful moment. Uh, I yeah, figured I mean, you'd she, appreciate that. No, absolutely. She, I mean, she, I'm surprised she didn't nuke his ass. <laughs> but, uh, well, I, I can't think of a, a better story to, to end on. I want to thank you again for, uh, for coming in and, sharing your story, making the trip down here. It's been, uh, been a, a great and fascinating interview, one that I know everybody needs to hear. Uh, so thank you for coming. I oh, really man, Mike, it. thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to meet you, and thanks for all you've done for oh, our yeah. country, for canines. No, and uh, thanks so much for talking about it with me. It's been a real treat. Yeah, no, my, uh, my pleasure. Um, and on to more thanks. Thank you again to uh, Origin Labs for uh, sponsoring the podcast and having our back. Uh, I want to take a second to... To thank them, as, as always, for uh, having our back, not just from a sponsorship standpoint, but not having any stipulations on who we talk to, what we say, what we talk about, length uh, stipulations, none of that. It's completely my show. They're uh, you know, both respectful and uh, good about uh, letting me run my shit the way that I want. Uh, and more importantly is that they provide products uh, that are worth a shit and ones that I actually use. I've used them for years long <laughs> before they ever sponsored me or, or uh, anything of that nature. I am drinking one of the Jocko white teas right now. Uh, I do take the krill oil, the uh, joint warfare, uh, regularly uh, down the discipline. And there's a host of other products that Origin provides uh, that you should check out and uh, purchase. Great American company. Uh, and they support their, uh, their veterans uh, of the highest level. So uh, if you do have a dog, Go to teamdog.pet. Uh, that is the online dog training that I created uh, that has the CBD oil, the collars and leashes, um, the first aid kits, obviously the training. Uh, if you own a dog and you have not signed up yet, uh, go ahead and choke yourself again. It's the second <laughs> time. And uh, just do it. Uh, any of the products that I have are available on there, um, as well as just going to mikeritland.com for anything that, uh, that I have going on, whether it's speaking uh, training, dog sales, etc. Um, 
Lastly, but certainly not least, uh, I want to thank you, the listener. Uh, I would not have sponsors. I would not have the ability and the platform to bring such amazing guests like John on if there weren't the uh, hundreds of thousands uh, and at this point millions of people uh, who listen to this show and, uh, and continue to support us and spread the word about it. So thank you guys. I really can't thank you enough. You continue to humble me uh, in your support for the show. It, uh, it truly is remarkable, and I can't thank you enough. So uh, appreciate everybody. Uh, love everyone. And uh, until next time, this is Mike Drummond.